All right, welcome to the Snowmass Village Town Council Chambers. Today is January 3rd, it's four o'clock. And uh, we get a change of order here. So Megan, could you do the roll call? Your call. Mayor Madsen. Here. Uh, uh, Councilman Good. Here. Councilman Parker. Here. Councilwoman Shine. Here. Councilman Fentini. Here. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we do have public comment. If anyone's here for a public comment, that's for a non-agenda item. Are you Gary and Olga? Okay, great. So we'll we'll get your public comment during our that section. Uh, do we have any other public comments, Doug? Are you have public comment? Please come forward. Well, I'm Tony Fresca. Mine is in regards to vacation rentals. Should I wait until then? Or? Great. Yeah, just uh, save your comment until we get to that section, and we'll take care of you. Uh, any online comments, Doug? I don't think we have any online comments. Okay. Moving on to the consent agenda, we've got Mr. our draft Mayor, agenda. We have, we have one presentation tonight from the airport. Oh, correct. Let's it. do that first. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dan Bartholomew is here. Great, Dan. Thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So Clint asked me to do a presentation on uh, <coughs> how we prioritize aircraft out at the airport, uh, whether it's commercial, service, um, airline, or general aviation. So I thought I'd just give you a little presentation on how we do that and some of the things we've looked at and can and cannot do to um, work through those issues. So, so this was uh, the information that uh, Clint gave me. Basically, we were looking at uh, how landings of general aviation and commercial flights are prioritized and if there's anything that can be done to reduce some of the negative impacts on the commercial airlines. Really what it comes down to is uh, it's a first come first serve uh, situation at the airport. That's how Federal Aviation Administration air traffic control works is a first come first serve. Unless there's an issue with uh, fuel supply, uh, an, an incident on the aircraft, something like that, typically it's first come first serve. We do have some major challenges out at this airport. Uh, I've worked at a number of different uh, airport facilities this one is very unique in some of the challenges, and they really key into why we do have some issues between how general aviation or some of the business jets you see out there are prioritized versus how the airlines are prioritized. One of those issues is we have a, one, a single direction operation for the airport, uh, one way in, one way out. Um, operations come from the north to the south um, for landings, and they depart to the north from the south for takeoffs or departures. This halves lit, almost lit, quite literally are what we call throughput capacity. Typical airport will have about a throughput capacity if they can take off and land in the same direction about 30 aircraft an hour. That's just typical, about one aircraft every two minutes. We're on a perfect good weather scenario, winds, visibility, everything, um, temperatures. We can do about 18 aircraft an hour in this situation. When we get into other situations, it even drops further and I'll show you that in a minute. So this is how our, depart our departure profile works right here. We have straight in arrivals, but then departures will take off, they'll turn right, curve around and climb and climb over an arrival. Allows us to increase our throughput capacity a little bit that way. And this goes back to what I was mentioning before, about 18 aircraft an hour is on ideal operating conditions. When we get into what called uh, instrument flight rules or we're getting into less than ideal weather conditions, visibility is low, ceilings are low, things such as that. The FAA drops us down to about air, eight aircraft operations per hour. So eight arrivals and eight departures. We also have some limited parking options. And this is what really gets into the crux of why we can't prioritize sometimes. We have eight parking spots for Canada Air Region Jet 700 Series. That is it. We have no other parking spots. So if we had a ninth aircraft that wanted to come in, they usually will get held somewhere in the air. They will get held at their departing airport, usually if it's Denver, it's close enough. Or they will get um, diverted over to Grand Junction or sent back to Denver. We just get to a situation where we don't have any room at the end. That's unfortunately what happens here. 
We also have some limitations with the types of aircraft that can come in here. We, the only commercial service aircraft that supports us right now is the Canada Air Regional Jet or CRJ 700 series. That's that one. The last one of these was built, I believe, in 2010. So we're already looking at an aircraft that's almost 22 years old. The technology, technology in aircraft avionics is, is exponential. It moves very quickly. It's based on military technology a lot of times. 2010 is a very old technology. The airlines are no longer investing technology into these aircraft. They're using them and they're gonna use them up for their useful life, but they're not changing out the cockpits, making them more, uh, more advanced, you will. They also have a limited range. These are fairly small aircraft. They're regional jets. So flying them across country and then expecting them to circle for a while is not something they can do very easily. Usually they will get diverted to Grand Junction. That'll cause cancellations or delays up here. The airport also has a 95 foot wingspan restriction. Nothing larger than 95 feet can land or take off at Aspen Airport. The newer aircraft, the ones that would replace this, typically will have wingspans greater than 95 feet. So there's some definite um, engineering and some development changes we will need to make at the airport if we are to reduce some of these delays and capacity issues in the future. So I'll give you an example of uh, how this older technology works and just kind of ignore the fancy thing on the, on the side there. What it does is there are minimums that the airlines have to adhere to, okay? Because they're using an older technology, they're using a type of approach called the localizer or DME, distance measuring equipment. What this does is it gives them fairly high minimums. So the, what this is saying right here is the, they cannot be, get any lower than 3,200 feet above the ground or, and or three miles of visibility. With around here, when we have snow, three miles goes very quickly. If they don't at least have these minimums, it means they need to go into a hold or they need to divert. Or the hold so they can try again if the visibility clears or divert back to another airport where they can land. It has much lower visibilities. Standard um, approach minimums uh, are 200 feet and a mile. So that can tell you how much we are above that, okay? just because of the terrain around here. Now this starts to get into the differences between general aviation and the airlines here. As you can see, the airlines have fairly high minimums there. Okay, they, um, 3,200 feet, three miles of visibility. The newer technology that is in a lot of these general aviation jets is state of the art, okay? Um, currently, they can get down to 645 feet, substantially lower than the commercial airlines can and only one uh, five eighths mile visibility, okay? So while you may see cancellations and delays from commercial service aircraft, the business jets are still coming in because they have the regulatory rationale and they have, they, they have the legal authority to come in here due to those minimums, okay? They just have better technology. <coughs> they also have uh, more range on some of these business jets than the regional jets do. What happens is if a business jet is trying to come in here, it doesn't have those minimums, it will have to do what's called a missed approach. It'll usually go into a hold pattern right about here. It can usually swing around that hold pattern maybe three, four times max, and then it gets diverted. Something they usually that the general aviation aircraft don't have to do. And if they do get diverted, they don't get diverted as far. They go to rifle or eagle, typically, typically rifle. So as far as solutions, I don't like throwing a whole bunch of problems out somebody without offering some solutions, regardless of how iffy viability wise they may be. So as far as prioritizing the commercial service operations over general aviation, they tried that actually about five, six years ago. I talked to our air traffic control tower. They did do this at one time as a test. It didn't work out very well. Unfortunately, it created more delays than it actually helped. Um, what happens is we go back to the insufficient parking issue that we have. <clears throat> what will happen is you get a break in the weather, they prioritize all the commercial service aircraft to come in, all of a sudden they rush in. And you'll get 9, 10, 11 of them on the ground at one time. We don't have any place to put them. We can't put them on a de-ice pad because we're usually de-icing during these incidents. Um, can't put them where we park the general aviation aircraft. The airport does not have that lease. So we have eight parking spots 
possibly a ninth one, but it's very difficult logistically with that ninth one because it blocks one of those eight aircraft that are in there. Um, so we're stuck there. It actually created more ground delays at other airports by us being at full at the end, so to speak, and those aircraft at the other airports couldn't take off to come in. So those aircraft either got canceled or delayed in some fashion. Um, it can also be considered discriminatory. Air, the FAA is supposed to treat everybody the same, regardless if it's a Cessna, small Cessna single engine, or it's a Gulfstream jet, or it's an airline. All of them are treated on a first come first serve basis. Now some of them may be you know, logistically moved around a little bit based on speed and some things like that. Um, but generally they all have to be treated the same. Slots and reservations, so you can have people set up times or reservations so it's more streamlined, just like a restaurant. Somebody comes in, eats, leaves, somebody flies in, lands, next person can fly in, land, somebody takes off. Um, the problem with that is it tends to have significant impacts on the national airspace system. It's not just what's happening here. You start stopping people up or slowing them down because they have a reservation, that impacts the aircraft going into LA, San Francisco, New York, Miami, everybody else. Okay, it just has an ancillary cumulative effect throughout the whole national airspace system. It doesn't seem like it should be a big deal, but it really adds up very quickly. There is a, an app out there that some of the general aviation pilots are able to use right now where they can attempt to sign up for a pseudo slot, so to speak. It's not an official slot but they get their name in there and they say, well, we we're planning on coming in about this time. Can you make a space for us? So it's sort of advanced notice is really what it ends up being. Um, they're working on that right now. It's something they've just started within the last couple of months. Um, it's not anticipated to be a game changer. It's not expected to have significant impacts on anything. They're just trying it out to see how it works. Newer aircraft, that is probably our single best thing for delays and cancellations here. That puts every aircraft on par with every other aircraft in here, okay? You, you get the lower minimums, you get the better visibility out that and an aircraft could come in. Doesn't get delayed in the air, doesn't get delayed because it gets diverted and doesn't get a ground stop, okay? Because the, the same visibility that the general aviation aircraft owners are using is what the commercial aircraft will be able, able to use. And then there's a perception that we're, we, uh, prioritize general aviation over airlines. Actually, it just looks that way. I sit at my desk and I look out the window and I'm like, wow, look at all those general aviation aircraft go by. It's because there are four times as many general aviation operations here than there are commercial. So for every one you're sitting there, you're seeing four of these aircraft go by. It's like, well, they must be prioritizing those guys. That's not actually what's happening. It's just there are more general aviation operations, so it looks like they're being prioritized. And I've had numerous chats with our air traffic control tower about this, and they have assured me they do not prioritize. And they, they even alluded to the perception issue. <coughs> and they see it themselves. So that is really what we're looking at at the airport right now. Those are our solutions. Like I said, the best, you know, the best solution we have is probably a newer version of a commercial service aircraft uh, to help us out. The other ones are pure physics and limitations on the airport environment that we live with. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. I, I have yeah, that's really helpful. I really appreciate that information. Oh, my I think it's, I think it's um, you know, addressed some of the concerns that we've heard before. Um, Bob sat on the visioning committee and I think Clint's on the committee now. I was on Tom it. Tom was, was on it too. It. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so in your, um, Cursory view at, a, at the vision for the new airport. Mm -hmm. Will it start to address some of these issues? It will. Um, I think the first um, course business here is to to get a new terminal in place. That will allow us to have some more st uh, staging areas, mm -hmm. some more apron space. Uh, that should help alleviate things a little bit. Uh, the movement of our air traffic <clears throat> control tower may help a little bit as well because it gives them better visibility on what's going on in the skies a little bit. Um, Right now, their visibility is not bad. It's not below regulations or anything like that. It's not a safety issue, but making it enhanced is going to be, you know, that'll help stage aircraft and cycle them through. Uh, next, we get into some of the airfield design issues. We do that separation between the runway and the taxiway, which currently restricts us to 95 feet. If we can get that proper separation, the additional 80 feet between those center lines, um, 
then we can start addressing and we can get newer aircraft in here. I mean, vastly newer aircraft, state-of-the-art aircraft. <clears throat> right. That'll help out tremendously. Great. Tom? Dan, thank you very mm -hmm. much. So, quick question. Um, we have a localizer on top of Aspen Mountain yes. when planes take off. Mm -hmm. Would an ILS, ILS be more helpful than the localizer itself as far as landing goes? Sure. Why, and why don't we have an ILS? Okay. So, and and it might, you might explain to the, the people what an ILS is. I, I know sure. what it is. But. Okay, sure. So an instrument landing system uses the localizer, uh, and what the localizer does is it keeps the aircraft on center line of the runway. Um, the glide slope, which is the other component or the second component to an ILS, that is a standard, or it can be a substandard, but it's a glide slope that the aircraft follows on the way down. We can't have a glide, we can't have a glide slope, hence we can't have an ILS at Aspen because of the terrain issues. We have extreme steepness, if you will, and some step-down approaches where the aircraft starts at one angle and then changes after they pass some terrain to a different angle. But that's just when they're landing on 1-5. Not three three, correct? Correct. Because I've seen some of the commercial jets take off going into Aspen, which is taken off on one five, yeah. depending on the winds. Because predominantly the winds in the morning are coming out behind us, coming mm -hmm. down the cold valleys, and about eleven o'clock they change and and come from the north most of the time. Most, True. Except summertime, we get all kinds of crazy winds. For the most part, our terrain here is just not conducive to an ILS, not conducive to a glide slope. Um, <clears throat> the thing with the nice part about an ILS is you can get much lower minimums because you're stationed on an actual glide slope. You have that full component. But these CJ Canadian jets are, mm -hmm. are set up for it because they, yep. they, they use the ILS in Grand Junction. They use the ILS in Grand Junction. They'll use it at other airports, absolutely. Eagle. Yep, Eagle. Uh, but we don't have an ILS. The best we can do... And there's some great approaches that are out there that could be designed in here um, to get us very low. Um, Precision-based navigation is what they're called, or PBN. Um, those are equivalent or better than many ILSs. Um, but Canada Air Regional Jet, especially 700 series, cannot do those type of approaches. Tom? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Dan. It's mm -hmm. nice to meet you. I, I did spend 18 months in the AAC Visioning Committee. <laughs> and, you know, this issue would come up, mm -hmm. and we sort of get one of these answers. Sure. You know, this. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality is, and I'm really upset about this, um, a new airport is 8 to 10 years away. <clears throat> Hopefully the CRJs will last that long, but that's how far away it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, a couple weeks ago, on December 18th, a Saturday, perfect weather in Aspen. Perfect weather. Every commercial flight coming in was significantly delayed. I mm -hmm. mean, four or five hours, right? Mm -hmm. Family member of mine was traveling with somebody who knows a lot about these things, who's a local, and got off the plane and saw somebody they knew working at the airport mm -hmm. who confirmed mm -hmm. it was because of all the private jets coming in that pushed out the commercial jets. Yeah. No. So, they... I mean, we're 10 years away. Mm -hmm. So on a day like de December 18th, mm -hmm. you've got maybe 600 to 1,000 visitors and residents mm -hmm. who are delayed numerous hours. Mm -hmm. So the private jets, of which there's 75% of the operations, private jets, mm -hmm. Um, and I believe the number we heard in the ASC vision was that the average passengers on a private jet's like four or five people, right? That's, that's about right, yeah. So you've got hundreds, if not a thousand or more people mm -hmm. whose schedules have been totally dis blown away for a handful over of privileged people coming in. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be some equitable way of dealing with this, giving some priority to commercial planes of what we have today. And instead of just saying, we got to wait till we get a new terminal, we got to wait till we get a new airport. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's eight to 10 years away. True. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to have more and more problems. So there's got to be something that smart people could figure out. Sure. Now, we are told that there, the two choices were the first come, first serve. And how do they determine first come, first serve? When they get to our airspace or mm -hmm. when they leave nope. where they're coming from? Exactly. It's when they get to our airspace. 
Yep. So they start to line them up, put them in right. line. Um, we're told it's either that system or what they did four or five years ago was a reservation system, and the private operators would abuse it by overbooking reservations. Mm -hmm. Now, there's got to be a way to manage that. You know, sure. <laughs> you know, every plane's got a number. You only, you only get one slot or mm -hmm. something. So I just don't accept on behalf of all of our citizens and all of our visitors that, oh, there's nothing we can do until we build a new airport. No, no, I, I agree with you on that one. Um, first of all, I completely wholeheartedly agree with you on, you know, an aircraft with four or five people on it taking precedent over, you know, one that has 70 people on it. Yeah. That shouldn't happen. But it, unfortunately, it does. Um, there is one other thing that's taking place potentially here. Um, we're looking at a newer aircraft coming in here, the Embraer 175. It's about the same size from a passenger load standpoint, carries about six more passengers, um, has a lot wider wingspan, but does not exceed the 95 feet, yep. and it has a much newer technology base that can get in with some of these precision-based navigation. So we're looking into that. Um, that operate? 12 months of the year, I thought there was a problem operating that in the summertime. They do. They do have a bit of a, what they're working on is uh, working on the engines right now to try to get them more power, trying to draw more power out of the engines through a software upgrade. Mm -hmm. If they can get that taken care of, then we should be looking at possibly maybe 12 months from now having those aircraft at least starting to come in here. But you've got to convince SkyWest to fly them, right? Y yes. Yeah, okay. that'll be part of the problem. You know, and we do have another issue here that... Let me just go back here. You know, I talked about we only have so much room at the end. Mm -hmm. These spaces <clears throat> are designed for a CRJ 700 with a wingspan that's fairly short. And the Embraer 175 is bigger. Much larger, about 11 feet more than these. So for what we're doing, what we're going to do this um, spring is actually we're going to try to be proactive, and we're going to design oh, this is the right button, two spots, one over here mm -hmm. and one here for the Embraer 175. So we'll put in two spots this coming year. So in the hopes that those do come in, we can stage those now. And then hopefully that'll hold us over until we get a new terminal. We can possibly maybe finagle one other spot in the middle here to accommodate, you know, sort of a swing gate. We can get both aircraft in there. So we are trying to be proactive at the airport. And we can't get any space back from the general aviation. No, they're, I hate to say it, but they are packed in there pretty tight too. Not to say they should have the same priority with things as their belts, but they are quite packed. Well, in I know, sometimes. but I mean, I, I mean, how long is there at least for? September, 2023. So we're going to be looking at that yeah. when we do this. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Bob? Dan, hi. Thank you for uh, coming and sure. appreciate all the information. Um, I got a couple of things. You know, I, I recognize that there's limited space for eight, planes and but there's something that feels out of sync and that is um, if you have planes up in the air mm -hmm. and they can't get a landing time until they get into our airspace mm -hmm. how does a plane take off in San Francisco not knowing you know what the situation is here what, runs, what you run into there is the, many of the computer systems. So they, they do know where every plane is at all times and are cycling them in and out uh, and routing them. The problem is the weather many times. Um, you run into, you know, the weather may be good when they take off or is expected to be okay by the time they land or they're willing to chance it and expect that the weather's going to be okay by the time they get here. That's one factor. The other one is things just change in the air sometimes as well as Planes get you know slow down, winds change, things like that. That you know things don't go exactly how they plan it. Therefore, you get some congestion, just like you do on a roadway. Yeah. Well, I mean that wasn't the situation on the day that that Tom was talking about. And I could understand if there were um, you know a lot of planes, mm -hmm. um, commercial planes in, mm -hmm. right, not being able to get out. Mm -hmm. But they were getting some planes were getting in and out all day. Um, but there weren't the slots. I don't think it was a slot problem. I think it was a traffic problem. And the traffic is created by the private planes. Mm -hmm. So um, we've, we know we've got this problem. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have our, the Aspen Chamber and, and others, you know, 
who deal with, and the county, I guess, too, you know, who deal with trying to provide the greatest number of, um, of, of seats for our guests mm -hmm. to come in. Um, it seems to me that what we are doing is we are creating a situation where our guests are inconvenienced um, because of these delays and, and so forth. And our guests are in, inconvenienced, uh, and yet we, we still continue to find more flights. Like this winter, we have the, the most number of flights, commercial flights, coming in and leaving that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And what does that do? That just puts more pressure on the air airport, and it probably, I would say probably, but I feel the probability is pretty high, creates additional, um, additional delays, both in and out, mm -hmm. for our guests. So long term, that's a loser. It is. Yep. And, and I don't know that, um, I mean, I don't know, you're in the middle of that. You probably <laughs> don't have a lot of um, a, a sway in how many flights we bring in and out as long as we get this 18 um, number, you know, turnover every, every hour. Um, but I don't know, um, maybe somebody has got to get together with um, the, the county and the, uh, the chamber and really get some data on how much, how much delay this is affecting our, our guests here uh, and, and get, get into that. Because just to go willy-nilly, you know, say, oh, great, we've got three or four or five or six more flights coming in this year. Um, Cal, Cal, there's nothing willy-nilly about it. I mean, that, that process of bringing in flights, I mean, I see Bill Thompson just walked in, between Stayas and Snowmass, which is a Snowmass village, Acra Ski Company um, partnership, and we of course partner with the uh, yeah, but but, but the, we we the, that planning of how how they fit, when they fit, when those show up, it is the opposite of willy nilly, whatever that is. Well, Clint, that's okay. I mean, I, I'm being a little facetious. Yeah, and I am right? just making. Yeah. Uh, but but the point is this: if you're spending all that time to figure out just how 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 many we can fit in here. Um, are we also keeping track of how many, um, how many delays we have coming in, yes. how many delays we have going out, yes. and we, do we really know that, and, and do we really know if they are, um, if they are um, caused by traffic rather than obviously by weather? Well, I, can, I can answer that for you uh, a little bit. You know, another problem or an independent variable in this whole mix that goes on is the airlines themselves. A lot of times they will schedule, because they have to meet banks around the country. You know, aircraft coming in from one place, aircraft comes to Miami to Chicago, need to meet a bank so that those air passengers can get from, my, you know, from Chicago to LA. So a lot of times they'll bring all the aircraft in it within a fairly finite period mm -hmm. of time, two hours, let's say, when we'll be wide open for three hours and then all of a sudden they'll hit a, you know, a, a busy time again. That's part of the problem because once those banks get missed, everything throughout the entire airspace systems gets backed up and impacts everything else. That's where you see some of these ground delays and some of these other things. Once you start to get a glitch in the matrix, so to speak, here, everything just gets chaotic and more and more so as it goes along. Entropy just kind of sort of goes throughout the entire system. Yeah, I, I, I sort of, I kind of understand that and I follow that mm -hmm. and... Um, <clears throat> It just seems to me that most of that is weather related. It can, weather's you know one significant variable in there, but then you start having congestion. You have you know pilots that timed out because they've been flying all day you know, due to yeah. delays. You just you can imagine the number of variables that go into this. It gets mm -hmm. very very complicated. Yep. Well, I but mean, the fundamental issue. The, the fundamental issue is that there's no priority for commercial flights over private. Our, our commercial no. guests are suffering at the benefit mm -hmm. of our private guests. I agree, and you know, one of the unfortunate parts about that is that's how the federal aviation system was set up. Um, we're a federally obligated airport, um, therefore we accept federal grants, therefore we cannot treat one passenger, one customer over another. 
one aircraft is one aircraft as far as and, the and, airport is And the other, pro you know, the other, another, mm -hmm. another problem that exacerbates this whole thing mm -hmm. is the lack of space for the GA to park as many planes as want to come in here now. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually takes an extra slot Right, because you got a landing slot, and then you got to take it off again, mm -hmm. and then they got to land to pick up, and they got to take off again. Mm -hmm. So it takes extra slots to get to get these people in and out on the private planes because there is no, you know, there's no parking. True. Now, the commercial jets are restricted by parking because they are. They got no, we got, there's no place to put them. Exactly. Right. But the private jets aren't really res restricted. From from coming in when there's no parking. True, they do what they call drop and so go. So yes. can't anything be done about that? So that the commercial jets and the private jets are at least on the same footing when it comes to having a parking slot. Uh, well, having more space for general aviation to park that is one option. We cannot liter we literally cannot stop them from coming in. Um, they can come in, land, drop off, and depart, which is the problem you're talking about. Right. The only other option to that is having more place for them to, to park, really. And yeah, but it, that's where our can we ever have enough? That's the question. True, and it's it's a difficult situation for us because we're our hands are significantly tied by the FAA and those types of things. Uh, and do they get a priority for taking off the private planes? No, no, not necessarily. No, so if there's a commercial aircraft coming in and there's private planes waiting to take off, mm -hmm. who has the priority? A lot of times the uh, commercial airlines will have, it's not departing here that holds them up. It's can they, their slot to go into another, to get them into, into a line to get into that, their destination airport. That's why you'll see them sit on their, sit while uh, our general aviation aircraft. General aviation aircraft don't have to get those slots. They're going, typically going into airports that don't, require slots or not as busy. But, uh, so you'll see, you know, so that's why a general, uh, commercial aircraft will sit there for a while. So a lot of times they'll sit there while other aircraft are getting, which seems like prioritized. It's not prioritized, they're just ready to go and can go. But Dan, you just talked about slots at other airports. So slots, we don't have slots. Slots in the airspace system, not slots at that airport. So it's getting them in line. Yeah. Well, Dan, um, aren't the, so the, the airlines, commercial airlines have a schedule, mm -hmm. right? Take off land. And mm -hmm. aren't the slots in the airspace designed around the schedule or the schedule designed around the airspace slots? Uh, the airspace is typically, it's a little both, but the airspace is typically designed around when the aircraft are scheduled to part and land. Okay. So if, 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 a, if an aircraft... Um, Loads up and is on the you know is on the taxiway, roughly within their their allotted um, time to take off. Mm -hmm. They should be able to get an airspace slot. Mm -hmm. They should be able to. Yes. Now that's where other things are happening in the airspace system that may slow right. them down. Weather in Dallas might slow them down, something like that. Would does the um, does the tower who you know gives the go ahead mm -hmm. right? Does the tower um, sort of are they attentive to the airspace to the to the takeoff slots and the you know, landing slots? Those oh, kinds absolutely. Of things? They're all in coordination. So They're the center is in coordination with approach and departure, who's in coordination with the tower. So they are all in coordination with one another. So in Tom's example on the eighteenth, where there was like a four or five hour delay, mm -hmm. those uh, private jets that are coming in. They get their priority once they get to the airspace, but those jets are held in Denver because there's so many private jets that have those landing spots? Not necessarily private jets that have those landing spots. It would be more that there are possibly weather conditions that are not conducive for them getting in. There was no weather condition either in Denver that or that could, in Aspen. And that could be something that's happening at Denver even. It may not even be an Aspen they, issue. They were held because they were told they couldn't get into Aspen. So the um, question, Daniel, the, when, when the planes come over the Red Table AOR, mm -hmm. they're released from Denver Center, and then it's VFR. 
on the way in, correct? For the most they, part, they, yeah. For the most part. The they tower the will tower. clear them. Correct. Then, then it's totally up to the it's pilot, it's pilot choice at that point. Absolutely. Now, if they decide, just like we had the incident years ago, um, all of a sudden the landing lights go out, and he thinks the landing, the landing lights are out, and all of a sudden they come back home because we've got blizzards going on in, mm -hmm. in March and April and stuff and that time of year. And at that point, when they go back up, Denver Center is going to pick them up. Correct. So now what, what happens then as far as the airspace? Where, where are they as far as the number goes? Now, if, if they want to attempt again another landing, they're going to have to go back out to the AOR, mm -hmm. get cleared by the Denver Center, Aspen Tower clears them. Okay, then it's up to the pilot. So, mm -hmm. so he's now VFR. Mm -hmm. So every pilot that comes in to this airport is VFR. Unless they leave, they pick up the localizer going out. That's why they go to the right. True. Correct. They'll even do the, yeah, they'll so do So I guess my point, my question is, they're all VFR, <coughs> basically. So, and that's, that's why there's no priority over a, a 172 Cessna over a commercial they're VFR once they get below minimums, or once they're below the ceiling and they can see. Right. Up to that point, they're IFR. Yeah. Okay. Excuse me. I think, I mean, moving forward, I mean, a couple of things. Just, I mean, one, I think our prioritizations, we're all saying the same thing. Dan's just saying there's more restrictions than, than we were otherwise aware of. Moving forward, um, you know, there's the seven person. Um, Airport Advisory Board now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure these will be topics. I'm sure we, I mean, I'm hearing my bosses loud and clear. I mean, I'm gonna be very comfortable working with Dan on this moving forward, doing the best we can. I'm, I know for a fact, just having family that works there, and I mean, I know they're doing everything they can to make it happen, and their priorities are right. And then the question for us, or what I'm hearing is, is there anything more? And if there is, you know, we will we'll find it, but uh, um, we gotta work within the rules we've got. And, and, and I'm confident that they, they see it just as much as we do. Um, and, and then kind of to the Councilor Circus's point, I, I know you're being a little you know, exaggerating some, but we do really try to make sure that we don't, ha they were, we had much more opportunities to bring in more flights, and we purposely did not, because we knew that the, the capacity of the airport was not there. So we do really try to find that balance, and that is an ongoing balance that we try to find. So it's a, a lot of balls in the air, and uh, we'll, we'll keep working through it. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Oh, my pleasure. And since we have uh, Bill here, uh, do you have anything to add to the conversation? I know you've worked very hard to get flights in here. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Mayor. Um, yes, for the record, I'm Bill Tomsich, and I'm a consultant that works with a group called Fly Aspen Snowmass, and of which uh, the town of Snowmass Village is a party. And uh, I just want to answer, address a couple of questions that came up. One, uh, Mr. Circus, you asked uh, for a, a summary of uh, the flights. That's actually something I've been doing every day throughout the holidays since December 16th. Clint, I'll have this in your email inbox by the end of this meeting. I've been sharing it daily with I, Dan. I'll pay attention here, but I'll get it to him tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been sharing this information, and I've been tracking it very closely. Uh, one correction, we peaked out at a total of 37 daily flights, commercial flights through the holidays. And that was also... Clint, as you said, by design. We have had as many as 42 daily flights in the past, and that was just too many um, for the, the infrastructure and the facility to handle. And then related to the, the 18th of December specifically, because I actually have it here, there were 37 flights scheduled that day. It was the first day that Delta resumed service, and the first day we went to that full 37 um, daily seat count. Uh, and of those, um, 32 successfully landed. And one half of them, so 16 of those 32 flights that landed that day were delayed by more than an hour. Uh, there was only a handful that were actually delayed by four or five or six hours in one case. And most of those were Americans' flights from DFW. So half of the flights that actually did come in were within one hour of on time that day. Uh, I think that kind of got, got lost in the message. But there were, there was one diversion to Grand Junction, another diversion back to DFW. That was a mechanical and four canceled flights because they couldn't uh, make up the time by the end of the night when they had to be on the ground at, at ASC by 11 p.m. So I've been tracking all this stuff every single day. There were a lot of many worse days since then, um, since <laughs> de uh, December 18th. But I think that's fresh on everyone's mind because the weather was so good that day. Yep. And, and, you know, and there is another reason that's also has not come up that has been contributing to all these delays. And this is how very tightly scheduled the very limited fleet of CRJ 700s is within SkyWest system. SkyWest is a sole operator of the United CRJ 700s here. There are only a grand total of 19 of those aircraft that still are painted in United colors. 
only five that are painted in Delta colors. And then they have a whole bunch for American, about 90 now that are in American colors. A lot of them are former uh, United Tales. But of those 19 that are in United Colors, um, over the fall, as many as six of them were in the shop for heavy maintenance. Several of them just got removed in early December. So now 17 of those 19 shells are available to fly the entire Aspen schedule, along with two other mountain markets that need those CRJ-700s. That includes Gunnison on the other side of the hill. And the Bishop Airport uh, in the Eastern Sierras also need that aircraft. So those 17 shells are going back and forth between these three airports, mostly Aspen, but also have to touch a SkyWest maintenance base every other night, which includes Salt Lake City, Tucson, Oklahoma City, Milwaukee, et cetera. So it's the, the scheduling complexity is extraordinary. And that has contributed to some of the problems. You know, you have one little hiccup, and all of a sudden, schedules fall like dominoes. They get delayed, and that also happened on December 18th. It wasn't just because of the, um, um, the airspace issues. That was a major issue, and that's what was blamed on a lot of the delays. But there were a lot of other factors that went into that. And just case in point, if you drive by the airport, you're going to see a snow-covered CRJ-700 that had a mechanical last week. It went out of service. It hasn't flown since last Wednesday. Um, that has resulted in 30 flight cancellations, mostly at Aspen, but several other airports as well over the last six days. So there are a lot of different factors going into it, but to support Dan's punchline, the solution is newer aircraft. These aircraft are old. Uh, they have 1990s technology in them uh, and you know they, they can't fly this the, the kind of approaches that can be developed for modern aircraft and the last question I want to address with you about the ILS um, the new approaches that Dan was talking about uh, with uh, performance-based navigation and actually what they call an LPV approach has been built by a, a flight engineer we're very closely in touch with and has been successfully used at Sun Valley. They already have a prototype built for the Aspen Airport, and effectively what it does is simulate an IL, ILS that allows it to bend around the terrain. So, so it's incredibly advanced technology, and this will be a game changer when it's able to be introduced onto these. So, these so Bill, you said 17 or 19 of the jets with, for SkyWest have the United symbol on it, correct? Yep, 19 so, have the United symbol. Two of them are in the shop for heavy so, maintenance. Several weeks ago, I, I flew to Banff, and it was in, on the CJ. That was one of them. Um, okay. N now, I tell you what. This guy landed this plane. It had to be 45-mile-an-hour crosswinds. And he landed that plane. And I'm thinking, we, there's no way we're going to land. And, and we landed in Calgary. And it, it, it was 14 <coughs> below zero and 40, at least a 45-mile-an-hour crosswind. So I'm thinking, why can't the Aspen pilots do that? Calgary is uh, located down on the plains. You don't yeah. have the surrounding no, terrain. But yeah, but it was a whiteout. Yep. I'm thinking there's no way he's going to land this plane. Mm -hmm. He landed that Full plane. Full ILS, yeah. Yeah, through ILS. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, Bill, in your conversation with the airlines, this, um, this new jet that Dan had referenced, what's, what's your take on that? Is this, is this uh, a reality that the airlines are going to start picking this one up? It's a lot closer to reality now than it was two years ago, but it's still a ways off. Um, as Dan mentioned, there are some engine upgrades that need to be made to this particular aircraft for the airlines to feel really comfortable flying that aircraft and being able to perform better on departure and be, to be able to take a full plane load, say, to Atlanta, uh, like is the farthest that a CRJ-700 can fly out of here right now. Uh, so those are the trade-offs that are being designed behind the scenes. There are two major obstacles to getting the E-175 in. One was the, um, the approach procedures, and that has already been built. Uh, it just needs to be flight validated and tested. It's already been done in the simulator. Uh, the second piece is getting some extra engine performance, Tom, to address the issues that we saw during the AAC envisioning process mm -hmm. that will solve some of those issues. And this is something that is physically possible. Uh, it just, they haven't actually written the check to figure out who's going to pay for these, this technology mm -hmm. upgrade. I'm told the chips are on the table, and it is possible to get what, more what thrust What is the capacity these of the 175? Mm -hmm. How many passengers? Um, they're configured for either 70 or 76 seats, so roughly comparable to the CRJ-700. Mm -hmm. Bill, is that Embraer in service now and other places? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. a new plane. Uh, some of the, the, in fact, the ones that are uh, WAAS-equipped, uh, W-A-A-S stands for the Wide Area Augment Augmentation System, and SkyWest nicknames, nicknames this uh, subfleet of aircraft the WASPbirds. These are the ones that are flying into Sun Valley right now. They're actually configured for 70 seats and a very comfortable configuration with mm -hmm. 12 first-class seats and a whole bunch of economy-plus seats as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous product. It would be great for this community. 
Um, but it's going to take a little bit more time before this becomes a reality. But I believe that what's happened over the past two weeks, and it wasn't just December 18th, it was a very tough holiday season <coughs> all the way through today. Mm -hmm. um, this should escalate the, the need for improving technology. And that's one of the reasons I've spent so much time documenting every single day mm -hmm. of what's happened here. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, so for, yeah, thanks uh, for all the work you do. Thank you. That's, that's where we hire them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a complex issue, but I appreciate you keeping tabs on it, Dan. I really appreciate your report. It's uh, very enlightening. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. We've got the draft agendas, the minutes for approval, and we have resolution uh, number one of series 2022. Any comments on the draft agenda? Yeah, I just want to, um, I guess, comment um, relative to the um, ROWAPA uh, IGA um, that uh, we, perhaps everyone has seen, hopefully everyone has seen John's email from earlier today that um, he added Glenwood Springs into the ordinance and um, it's uh, a resolution and the resolution yeah the resolution it was already in the agreement right but Garfield County wasn't which seemed very strange and April pointed it out to us so you have a new resolution and um, agenda item summary in front okay. of you that includes the booming metropolis of Glenwood Springs. Okay, and this is, again, just bringing it up so everybody was aware. And, yep. Um, there she is. And there's April. <laughs> Hi, April. Happy New Year. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. I am here and happy to um, give more explanation on this or answer questions if you have any. Just let me know what you need. Okay, great. Um, why don't we go through the draft agenda first? Any questions, comments on the draft agenda? I, I do have something for Megan, but I'll, I'll go over Megan a couple of those days in February. I have to do virtual, so I'll, I'll, I'll give Megan those dates. Okay. okay. Um, I, I, well, yes, I had lots of changes to the minutes. Rhonda went out like a bang <laughs> <laughs> with lots of grammatical errors. Um, I sent them to Megan and, um, I just, when I was looking back at my notes, I remembered that at the end of this last year, I had mentioned something about dial ride and if it's meeting the community need and if we had something that maybe we would want to apply to the RAFTA, new RAFTA grant program for. So I would like an update on dial a ride and how that is and you know if the services we have within the village are meeting the needs of the people within the village. So I'm sorry. I don't, the RAPTA program's got, can you rephrase what you need? I'm sorry. Okay. So remember I talked about the grant program that RAPTA is now doing, which Basalt is using for their downtowner. The last mile program. Yes. Yes. So my question was, is dial a ride meeting the needs or is there something that we should explore while RAPTA is offering this grant program for these types of exploration things? Okay. I mean, I don't, no, I'm going to answer that, but I mean, Dial Ride's about a $60,000 year program that for those of you that don't use it, it's a program that gets folks um, in within the village. We don't go outside the village with it. And if you're not on a route, then you can use it um, I can't, a certain number of times a month. I think it's, I think it's four times a day. I don't remember exactly to and from different locations in town for the cost of a dollar roughly. And so, but the last mile with RAFTA is a serve as a, they're looking for ways to get people on the RAFTA service. So dial a ride, if, this, if people were taking dial a ride <coughs> to the RAFTA bus, yeah, then that would be it. And is the question, are people taking dial a ride to the to RAFTA service? Well, I mean, there's a reason that Basalt is looking at the downtowner and in, instituted that program. And it's not just about getting people to the bus, it's also just getting people circulating around. And there's a lot of people that don't live on the bus route. Right. So I guess it's just really, I mean, it's like, doesn't have to be answered in five minutes, but more of an exploration of, are we meeting the needs of the people within the town with our bus service, with dial a ride as a supplementary service? And is there anything we'd be interested in exploring? That was, I, 
I don't know. I would, I would look to my bosses and say, I don't know. What do you hear? It's like, yeah. Every time we do every kind of survey, the answer is yes. We're moving 4,000 people a, you know, a day last week. Um, I mean, I would look to you. If, if we're hearing people that want more service, yeah. well, we, we, I would, I'm happy to schedule. It's, a, it's just a difficult question to answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's a question for Dave Packler, really, right? It's well, he, I mean, he's going to say, give me more buses and more drivers and more money, and we can have more service. I mean, th I, mean I am confident to tell you that we've, we operate the most efficient service you're going to get. Um, and, you know, over the years, there's been switches back and forth. Um, in 08, we had, a, we had service reductions this year because of staffing. We've had some service reductions um, because we just can't get enough people to drive the buses. But um, I would say overall, we, we're, we move, and you know, it, it depends on how you want to measure. You know, riders per hour is one way, riders per mile is one way. There's lots of different ways. Um, and, and if you're asking, hey, is this an opportunity for us to expand service? I think that's a question we can absolutely explore. Yeah. But if you're asking, hey, is there more service that we want out there? Then it's, it's, I mean, that's kind of, I'd look to you guys and say, is there more service you're hearing that we want out there? But I mean, yeah, we're, I'm happy to schedule the conversation. I mean, how much, how, how many people does the di does Dial Ride serve? I mean, off the cup, I can't. No, I know, I know, but that's, that's the, the kind of. I it's, think is that if you the remember, kind of question two, to start two years, with? And two years ago, if you're two years ago, it was it's our least cost effective way to move people, um, and I can't. I mean, it's it's. I don't remember the numbers, so I won't say it. But it was expensive as heck. And it was one of the items that I, in my proposed budget to the council at the time to cut because yeah. it's so expensive. And the council said, nope, we're not doing it, and which is fine. And we, we came through the recession, but we, the, through the, we didn't need to. You guys were smart, made a good choice. We didn't cut it. But I, I, I am confident in telling you it is our most expensive service that we provide. Well, that's why it's like, is there something with this grant money from RAFTA that we could do in conjunction with the service we already provide, whether it's like a shuttle thing like the SALT's doing that is just a smaller sort of van to get people from point A to point B. I don't know. I'm just saying it's out there and that I don't want us to forget about it. And I think that if there's something that we're itching to try, it's a great opportunity. Matt was it. All right. I, want, I wanted to bring up another item that I guess we discussed, but I didn't quite hear this part, but it just brings up a question. So on the December 20th on line 44, it was mentioned that there's no town council alternate for, for Bill on the Board of Health. And I wondered, why that? I know Marky's on it, but my understanding is Marky's on it as a private citizen. It's, you know, a, from the general public. So is it, I just don't know how that one's set up. I mean, is, do most people have an alternate for when they can't be there? There's an alternate? I mean, Marky's not your alternate. Marky's there on her own. So should we well, have no, an she, alternate for you? I mean, she is the alternate. Um, from She's service. not a voting member. She's not no. a voting member, but but Aspen has an alternate, and so does so does Pickens County as well. I thought uh, Markey was selected for the Board of Health on her own yeah. for an open seat at, from the general public, as opposed to being representative of the town of Snowmass. She is a Snowmass Village representative. She was the voting member. Now I am. I know when she was on council, she was. Correct. She was the mayor. So she's your alternate then. Correct. Okay. That's not how I understood it, but I'll take your, your explanation. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anything else? <coughs> April, thank you for your patience. Well, we need a motion, huh? Um, Did we? Uh, the, Resolution number one is in the, on the consent agenda. So let's go through uh, resolution number <coughs> one. Uh, questions for April? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm the executive director of the Root Eye Water and Power Authority and have provided the memo and the updated IGA for you that um, John Dresser has reviewed and correctly amended most recently today to include the city of Glenwood Springs in your ordinance. And um, and so I'm, I'm happy to, 
explain more than that, but you have the memo. And if you want me to just be available for questions, I can do that as well. Okay, questions for April? I have questions. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay, so, hi. I have two questions, hi. April. So the first one, it says that decision-making in 2B, the, that change that was made, is it all new? Is part of that new? That entire paragraph and section is new. And so there was no more information about how um, the board made decisions until okay. that section was added. So previously, the way it was explained in the IGA and the bylaws and the way that it has been acted upon since its inception is that we act by consensus. And Pitt and County requested more information about decision making um, for um, decisions that are that may serve as representation of all of our entities. And so that language was added to clarify when we make decisions by consensus versus when we make decisions by un unanimity, unanimous vote. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if unanimity is a word. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> Spell it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Does okay. that, is that enough explanation or would you yeah, like for me to Yeah, I just, that's okay. how I understood it, but I just wanted to make sure. And then my other question is, so in the summary that you provided us, mm -hmm. it says um, that you're making a change to include a major function of RUAPA being the management of the invasive species detection program, and blah, blah, blah. It goes on, you know, to protect the threat of the invasion of the aquatic nuisances, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But when you look at section 1A6 on page three, it doesn't really say all of that. It just like kind of throws it in there. And so if it's a major function of RUAPA, it just feels like it's not really spelled out like that. And so that was in, um, you know, I don't have the IGA open in front of me because I can't see you all if I do that, but in there's, a section that kind of briefly mentions it and then there's a like what I would call like a bullet point a specific section for it a one complete sentence that is a little further on in the IGA and so it might be that it's in section 2 a okay. where okay. it goes into a little more explanation but it essentially says to um, it essentially says what I summarized to prevent to to manage the program um, for the prevention of aquatic nuisance species at, at Root Eye Reservoir and throughout our watershed. Okay, I maybe I somehow says. missed it. I just didn't okay. see that. Okay. Yeah, it kind of briefly hits it in the first part and then it gives a little more explanation in the second part of the IGA. Okay, great. And the reason that wasn't included in the IGA um, that was signed in the early 2000s is because that threat that didn't the the exactly. zebra and quagga mussels did not become a threat in the u.s until around or in the western u.s until 2008 and so our program didn't begin until much later okay great thank you okay april are there uh examples of other reservoirs in colorado that are <laughs> at a similar elevation to rudai that are uh, experiencing um a mussel invasion Right, so luckily in Colorado, we don't have mussels invading any of our reservoirs yet. And that's due to this really rigorous inspection and decontamination program. So Colorado is currently mussel free, but yes, there have been um, serious threats to similar high elevation reservoirs like Green Mountain Reservoir, which is monitored like all of the other reservoirs in the state. Um, and during one of their monitoring, they found the larvae for mussels, so not an, not an actual adult mussel, but um, some of its eggs. And so it, it was put into a high risk category for I think five years and it was inspected and monitored like lots of water quality monitoring in that area and not, no population ever developed. And so it has been removed from the high risk level, but it is um, in similar elevation as Rudine. Alyssa? Back yeah. to your question, yeah. on page five of the um, IGA, 
Um, item number three uh, basically says that um, the authority shall have the power necessary to carry out the purpose to manage the invasive there species protection program. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I like it was okay. Thank you. I somehow missed that. Great. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for looking out for it, and thanks, Bob, for finding that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone who uses the reservoir quite frequently, uh, the team is really doing a great job up there. So you're to, you're to be commended for that. Thank um, you, and I appreciate the feedback. And all because I'm not a recreational boater, so or a motorized boater. Um, so anytime you have feedback, please please send it my way. I'd be happy to hear it. Great. Um, I just had uh, a question uh, in the resolution number three. Um, one of the points is to sell, lease, and otherwise allocate water supply held by the authority under the contract of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and to maximize uh, the extent permitted by law. I'm just curious, why do we want to maximize the sale of water at a reservoir? That's not what it I says. Would, hmm? it, it's talking about the authority that you get from the Bureau. It's not talking about the amount of water. Okay. okay. It's not saying we're going to sell as much possible water as we can. We're getting all the authority we can from the federal government into Ruwapa. It's not uh, gallons per second or however it's measured. Okay, acre feet, whatever it is. That's not what that maximum refers to. It means okay. we're getting all the authority that we can possibly get. When I say we, Ruwapa, right. from the federal government, and that's what that means. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, any other questions for April? Well, great work, April. Keep it up. Um, All right, I'll move, thank you very I'll, much. I'll if move this to is approved the, tonight, uh, then I will be returning with a DocuSign um, that I believe you, the mayor, will need to sign as well as your attorney, I believe. And so I'll have that in your inbox um, at, by the end of the week if everything is approved tonight. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll, move you. To, um, I'll move to accept the consent agenda. I'll second. Okay, and the only other item was resolution number two, 2020 a resolution adopting new members to the Board of Appeals and Examiners. Um, the only question I had there was, um, is that board still active? Has not met in a long time? So we had Gus as a, as an appointee. It, it doesn't hurt for the appointment. I mean, I know Councilor Good brought up the point. We, we've got the board, we should appoint the board. We've got someone that wanted to be on the board, so we've got somebody, but it has not been used in quite some time. Is there anybody else on the board? Don uh, Upper. I don't believe so, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't. I honestly don't know. But the, the goal was to kind of <coughs> fill it as we can, and so this is our chance to fill it as yeah, we can. Yeah, sure, okay. Okay, so we've got Gus. Um, Maybe Rhonda wants to join. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you, April. Thanks, April. Thanks, April. Thank you all very much. Have a nice night. You too. All right, administrative reports. We are on to our discussion regarding short-term rentals. All my guys first. Okay, Brian, Rose, Betsy, and David. Here. And we'll we'll present, and then we'll let you guys take it from there. But um, <coughs> in case there's any questions, so this obviously is a topic the council has brought up on a few different occasions, and um, as as we've discussed um, at different meetings, tried to find out you know exactly how we want how we as a community want to address short-term rentals. Um, so we developed this, this white paper that we put in your packet for you. And what we tried to outline was, um, the, well, the, the fundamental issue is what we think needs to happen first is kind of problem definition. What are, what are we trying to solve for? And then once we understand what those problems are, um, then we can provide a, a number of solutions, to, whether it's you know, a tourism-based solution, a housing solution, an enforcement solution, um, and Dave's here somewhere, land use type solution. Those are all opportunities we've got before us. But before we started going down those paths and started writing up those types of ideas, 
we really wanted to hear from you guys about what is it. Um, you know, in, in this packet, we provided um, some of the numbers that we've got, uh, how, we've, how we license now. In the past, our licensing process has been all about revenue. Um, the number one piece of feedback we've got consistently got for years is to make sure the, the playing field is level, that they, those taxes are collected. And I think I'm confident <coughs> in saying that we do a good job of that now. Um, but now those goals sounds like they're changing about what we need to be doing with our licensing system <coughs> process. So our goal tonight as council is to answer your questions or as staff is to answer council's questions um, and then hopefully get some direction from you on, on where to go. The, the last thing I'll add is uh, we did put in our, our last um, uh, transient report, or short, I call it the pillar report. Uh, there's a fancier name than that. But uh, it basically it's, it's how we keep track of how many um, rooms we've got available for rent. The last one we, we did was in 2018. We've got one scheduled for this year. And that's really the primary way that we keep track of capacity and about how much we can rent this uh, rent in the village and how much we can't. And that's, that's been our tool to date. Um, obviously, uh, since the 2018, we've got different tools, different permitting processes in place that we could utilize. But we're really looking to get some direction from the council about <coughs> you know, what are, how do we want to address this? Um, what are the issues you want to identify? And, and we can take it from there. Bob, you have a comment? Well, a question? I think they're going to make a I presentation. I think they're going to make a presentation. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, no. Oh, oh, I th I, oh, I'm oh no. Sorry. I misunderstood. No, no, I misunderstood. I thought That's oh, presentation. you were. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I can go through the, the white paper. I, just, I didn't oh, want to okay. waste your time. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, I, just, you I just brought the brains up to six. I don't want to be up here and trying to answer the questions oh, and right. the brain okay. for sitting behind okay. me. Could so. you maybe just do a little dance? Or uh, yeah. <laughs> That's what it was right there. I can say I've danced with everybody at this table. So, I, I will confirm that. Brian and, Brian and I are the best. <laughs> well, when I looked at the white paper and I looked at the 2018 Desimetrics report, I think they're both of them um, for, uh, at that time, um, it was, we're not capturing all the data that's necessary in today's time, I think, for us to capture. Um, so I think um, I'd like to, I would suggest that we, if we develop a system to count the number of units and the number of pillows for all the, for everything we have in Snowmass Village and, 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 and include, perhaps include residential and commercial, um, talk about how we define commercial, um, and, and, and you really get a big overview in data of what do we got and then um, how can we accurately count the, um, the short-term rentals and again in terms of unit numbers and, and pillows and I mean Desimetrics does a nice job of breaking it out into hotels and you know hotels lodges, condos, right, single family homes. I think that's very helpful. Um, and that, that kind of thing is, is what, we, what we need. Um, and, you know, it was mentioned a few times in the white paper about a specific uh, license, you know, for short term rental. Um, I, I certainly would um, support that, I think that, helps the data collection substantially if you do if we do that um, and most everything that was listed as a as an objective um, I personally agree with I, I, I think they are all items that um, that we need to you know we need to look at some um, some <coughs> kind of connected to one another. So if you sort of have one, you have another one. Uh, but but they're all you know, they were all very um, they were all very good in in analyzing <coughs> the uh, the effects of the short term rental situation that we have today. So um, if that's going to no. kick this off, that's. That's what I what I what I see. 
uh, or, or how I feel from what we, we saw. So I, I like a lot of the step two uh, options on the white page. And um, <coughs> the email we got from Pat Kiefer um, several days ago and, and you know, in regards to how are, how are these properties being categorized? Are they, are they now commercial? Are these people claiming this as a rental unit or are they claiming it as their individual home? We, there's no way for us to, as a town council to find this out. Well, and, and the property taxes, it's, it's, a, it's a residential property taxes what they pay. Cor correct, at this point. But if they go to short-term rental, are they changing over to commercial? The taxation would remain uh, it's, residential. It's the same. So that, that really doesn't make a and difference, that's, does that's it? That's dictated by state law. And so, again, that's one of those ideas that if, if that were something we wanted to do, that would, that would be you know, advocating the state level. Chain, to chain. So I guess my question is, uh, on, on the white page, <coughs> on the white paper, whatever you call it, a lot of the suggestions on step two are good, but they don't do anything for us. Well, and yeah. that's why, I mean, honestly, and that's why, you know, I didn't want to, like, come in here and say, here's how we hear the problems, because I want to hear what you're hearing. Right, but, uh, right. I mean, if, if the problems are community character, I've heard that in here. If the problems are uh, party houses, I mean, we've got those things. If the, if the problems are, you know, five years ago, I mean, Rose and I, or seven years ago when Rose and I started, it was, hey, get more people here. And now, maybe we did, maybe that's the, not the issue anymore. Now we need, that's the kind of stuff that I'm trying to understand of, hey, what are we aiming for? And then there's lots of tools to get us there. You know, I'm, I'm less concerned about generating more statistics, but once we figure out what it is we want to do, maybe there are statistics we have to learn. But to me, the issues are, um, and, and we also, you know, the abuse of short-term rentals. And what I mean by abuse is when you have a residential neighborhood which is being affected by homes being rented out like hotels. Um, there's a concern, I don't know if this is true in our community as, as other larger communities with more range of housing types where uh, employees who used to share long-term rentals are now being forced out because the short-term rental market has become so strong. I mean, I, I wrote up the chairlift this past week, some guy, a couple guys from Clearwater, Florida. I said, what do you guys do? And real estate, what, what, what aspect? Well, they look for properties for a hedge fund to buy, to rent out to short-term rentals, you know? And I think that, and I don't know quite how to phrase this succinctly, but that's what we want to avoid. Um, and it may not be a problem here now, and maybe it is. I don't, I just don't know. And maybe, and something we want to guard against in the future, we want to preserve the residential character of our residential neighborhoods. Now, many of the buildings in West Village, the original condo buildings were, and, and Base Village were, were always intended to be rented out hotbeds as much as possible. I think that's a different scenario from single family neighborhoods. Just as an example, because it came up in our HOA meeting, um, we have an agreement at Fox Run that was made in uh, an amendment to our bylaws in 2001 where nobody can rent for less than 30 days, except once a year they can rent for up to 14 days. You know, and I don't know what other HOAs have, I don't know what the snow mass HOA, you know, what they have in their governing language. But I, I, I think that's sort of the issue, the, the kind of topics that I'm interested in getting at. Um, there are certain areas in our town that are really designed for short-term rentals, and that's fine, but there are other areas that really aren't. We don't want that abused. Does that help, Clint? Mm -hmm. I don't know if others agree, but that's sort of where I feel, okay. I mean, to, to add on to that, I mean, I'm hearing stories of people who are not only, who are bringing in their own food and their own chef, and basically they come, they, they live in a house that they've rented, they ski for the week, and they don't, they don't add anything to the community. Um, yeah. You know, they, they <clears throat> use the community's infrastructure, and some, in some cases abuse it, I mean, uh, I can tell you that from my experience that the, um, the dumpsters in country club townhomes are overfilled 
uh, every every couple of days. Um, there's, you know, you can't necessarily say that that's short-term rentals, but it's just a lot of people coming and using the infrastructure. And um, I think that's part of what is is being, uh, is, is, I'll say, at its, getting close to its limits, um, that type of infrastructure. Um, I, I think when, when somebody, I think when somebody rents a house in a neighborhood and, you know, two or three families use a, a six or seven bedroom house, um, I, to me, that, that's, that's more of a commercial um, situation than it is a residential situation. Uh, so I guess it's the hotel, the, the house hotel mm -hmm. um, that you mentioned, Tom. Um, I know that, that that's a problem. Uh, I would like to know more about um, how many or what, my, what, has, what has happened to the long-term leasing market um, that we had in, I don't know, I'll pick 2018, but you know, it's somewhere in that range, pre-COVID. What's happened to the long-term uh, leasing market and particularly the long-term leasing market that um, employees uh, work the workforce was able to find in, in, the, in the free market. Uh, so there'd be free market long-term leases. Um, I, it, my my gut says there were there were a lot more people um, who were able to live on a free market long term lease than than there are now. Um, and and what is that based on? Well, that's based on the fact that we have um, we we didn't a couple of years ago have the same kind of shortage of help that we have now, um, and we, we know that now the, the, the shortage of help is a significant part of it has to do with there's no place to, for people to find to live. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess by, you know, just by trying to use, use some logic that back a few years ago, there must have been enough long-term leases for workforce or some more long-term leases for, for workforce that there was a, there were more people uh, who were able to work in, in, in the village because they had a place to live. And Betsy, what's your experience been? Um, are you hearing that from people who are looking for employee housing? I hear it, but it's anecdotal. And I honestly don't have a good idea on how to, f how to get data on that. It's, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't say it's changed since 2018, but maybe it's changed in the last 10 years, more so. I mean, I know, I know a number of people who have, um, who, have, who have left or who had to move out of where they were living because of, of, of real estate sales and that were then turned over into, you know, short term or some other situation other than a long term lease. And I've gotten those, I see those almost as two different things. There's a two phenomenon. One is that people used to share housing, let's say at Woodbridge or at um, Aspenwood or something, you know, they would, or at least in the off seasons they would share. There's less of that. At the same time, and this is very recent, people who have been renting had leases. When the lease turns over, the price has gone up extremely extremely, you know, $1,000 or more a month um, in one shot. I can't say that there has been a huge influx of that, but I didn't hear that in 2018. And I'm, I've probably get a couple of those a month that call my office, and that's just my office. So at the same time, it, it's, it is, if you're looking for data, I think it's very difficult to quantify that because we may all be hearing the same story. You know, we may all be you know, there could just be a handful. And I think that the tr a lot of the trend 
is not just a Aspen or not just a Snowmass Village, you know, Aspen Snowmass Village trend, but a trend, a resort trend across the country. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's that's certainly true. Betsy, I have a quick question. So, for instance, we have a we have a Creekside or a unit on the market right now that's going to go to mm -hmm. the lottery. Mm -hmm. Everybody that puts in an application, and they need to be qualified for a loan before that lottery yeah. even happens, correct? Pre, um, pre-qualified, pre -qual not pre-approved. Pre yeah, pre-qualified. So do they need to have that loan in hand? Or in no, hand? they need to, What the, I mean, it's not a high bar, but they go to a lender and a lender says, you know, based on your income and your credit, I would be interested in lending you okay. up to X. And Brian, what has your experience been as far as these, you know, quote, party houses or people, um, you know, parking on the street or, you know, other issues that we hear about? Um, you know, I would, I would say it's virtually unchanged. You know, COVID brought more people some longer term leases. A lot of people came and stayed for months when they would have stayed for a week or so. saw an impact in just uh, people in the village. But you know, from our department, my entire career uh, is, is virtually unchanged. There's the party houses that they don't really exist. Um, there's an occasional week when a, a raucous crowd come in. Um, you know, X Games is famous for that, but actually all the property managers locally no longer uh, rent to um, athletes and Is it not on? No, I thought I had a booming voice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so it's virtually unchanged. You know, it, 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 we have blips here and there, but there's there's no rise in, in complaints. We're not uh, uh, chasing our tail. It, it's you know the ski area side of the mountain is, is probably rented more than the sunny side um, horse ranch and and mountain ranch, but those areas <laughs> do have rentals and. Um, uh, you know they, they they get activity as well so for from my standpoint it's steady as it goes right now you you mentioned that you know many of the property managers watch out for these bad actors but um do we have a sense of how many individuals just put their house up on vrbo or airbnb and don't have that sort of vetting process I mean, from a standpoint of my response yeah. to any complaints, I don't have that kind yeah. of statistic for you. So I, I would say obviously that's happening, but it's not driving call volume for the police department. Uh -huh. okay. Just just not. Okay. From a data perspective, I would say um, we partnered with the Aspen Chamber a few years ago to do a study, and um, the data was just not reliable. Uh, what the study did was a point in, a moment in time and when you look at these units so we both ACRA and and Snowmass Tourism were like this is you know we had to throw away the study there was nothing good there in terms of studying they, Airbnb they scraped versus the internet and uh -huh. basically if you had a unit uh, on and they happened to do it in October and it wasn't available they assumed you rented it at your asking price for the year and so in October they were saying that we were you know at 98 percent occupancy charging nine hundred dollars a night for 200 for two bedroom units which is just not the case in October right had that had they done it in <coughs> December it might have been harder to determine that that data was not good um, so there are units that might rent 365 days a year and we have a whole slope side of them mm -hmm. right uh, and then there are other units that might just rent Christmas week. And so what we haven't found, and the city of Aspen, uh, if you've read the paper, is looking at this. And we've tried to figure out is if Snowmass Tourism and TOSV can partner with ACRA and city of Aspen. So we do one study. So we wind up having apples to apples in both communities. And rather than them go 
one direction. Destimetrics is getting us a proposal to do a short-term rental uh, inventory, like to augment the transient inventory. Clint mentioned it's on the docket and we've budgeted to do the transient inventory update in 2022. And we're looking at how they would layer a short-term rental. And as I said, the complicated part is really trying to figure out each unit and how many nights it's actually on the market because a lot of people, and you may know some yourselves, you know, rent a couple weeks a year. I mean, your HOA, it seems, that's what they allow, right? Yeah. Uh, we, and then the other, so yet, and so we haven't found a good vendor yet, but there are quite a few challenges with getting good data um, from, from that and being able to, we, I think we've jumped the hurdle of deduping because everything that's on a property manager site is also on VRBO and Airbnb. That is no, it's, so you have to dedupe it, right? Because we can't count it in the transient inventory study and say the Timberline has X number of units and then count it at, at the VRBO as well because we balloon our units, which yeah. isn't accurate. So we're trying to get over those humps, but I think to Clint's point, if we know more about what we're try, trying to get at, and I'd like to really push to get it coordinated so that we don't wind up reading about data in Aspen and data and we have apples and oranges and we can't kind of have any type of comparison of what in in the upper valley what that mm -hmm. looks like so uh, we don't have an answer for that but anyway thought I'd throw that in so the quick question are we are we concerned with the short-term rentals for increasing workforce housing because I don't see that even being an issue uh, I just want to make sure that's not the issue because it's more about are, is the municipality, whether it's Aspen or Snowmass or whatever town it is, getting their due share, correct? That's what it's been to date, but that's what I'm trying to understand from you guys. <coughs> is, is, is because I, I don't see it, I don't, the houses, for instance, Bob, your, your example of the people coming in, I mean, that's what COVID is, is, has done to people. They, they bring their own food in they, they don't want it they don't want to be around anybody they're, they're okay going on the mountain because they're in the, out in the open space but we've had this happen many homes for many many years and i don't think those particular homes have anything to do with taking away any workforce housing at all because well, our workforce is not going to be staying in those homes anyway then, can't afford it then tom let me um let me couch it in a slightly different way um we um for a long time, um, as you know, in the comp plan, we, we struggled on defining the, the resort and the community concepts, right? And um, we, I think it was in the white paper that we kind of landed on, you know, it's a, it's both. It, it's, it's both, and it's a balance, okay? I think in the past couple of years, the balance has shifted to the resort um, way more so than the community. And that's my feeling. Um, it's, I, I support that with, um, I guess, with the, with the, with the real estate market, with the, the, the short-term rental increase, with um, the fact that um, you walk into the... the, the the, the, the Snowmass Center used to be a place where you would go in and pretty much every day you'd see somebody you knew. Well, that doesn't happen to me anymore. I may, I don't know how, it ha how others feel about that, but um, I feel that that's, that's really way different. And but, you know, but, but their, their business is the resort. I mean, the, the, the local people, of course, are a big part of their business, but obviously their shelves are empty now, like every every store, because they can't get the trucks, they can't get the yes. supplies. Right. The, the roads are closed, right. or whatever reasons happen. Right. So, I, I, so, so obviously they're so, geared for more of the resort, don't you think so? Well, they try to be. I mean, yeah. but they really have, they're really serving the community and the resort. Uh, of course, they're. And speaking of which, I think our post office is doing a fabulous job this year. They, they, who is serving all the, most of the local people, of course. I, I think compared to years in the past, it's part of the same center, right? We're yes. talking about the same place. Yeah. And depending on what time of day you go in there, if you're lucky enough to get in there 
lunchtime, you're crazy to begin with, right? I mean, because of all the construction workers going for their lunch and so on. And, or if you get there early in the morning and only uh, are fortunate enough to make one trip to the market, then you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I, I mean, for me, the, the, the whole issue of short-term rentals, um, the issue of short-term rentals is substantially, to me, about, um, about the balance between the community and the resort, okay? A, short, a person who comes in for a week in a short-term rental, they're not participating in the community. They're using the community facilities. They're using the mountain. They may use the rec center or the snowmass club. You know, they'll use the they'll, they'll use some of the restaurants. They'll they'll you know they'll use the facilities, but they're really not contributing to the community. No, but I mean, somebody checking into a hotel, it's the same situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as, and I think we've taken care of equalizing the tax revenues <coughs> for the infrastructure. But it's when it gets abused. When you've got a house in your neighborhood <coughs> that's been bought by a hedge fund to be operated as a hotel, to me that's an abuse. Well, that is, I agree with that completely. I that's an abuse. I don't even know if that's a problem here in Snowmass. So, Dave, do you feel that there is a land use issue that we should be addressing? <coughs> I think there, <clears throat> there's numerous ways to, to look at the short-term rentals, but, and I, I'm in line with where um, Chief Olson was coming from. We've had, I think, one, maybe two complaints over the past year with people complaining that maybe there's too many bedrooms versus what's shown on the assessor's list. Uh, we don't, so we don't have the same issues that I've seen when you have a, a residential neighborhood, so, so to speak, that's being inundated with uh, short-term rentals. Um, and, and then again, we do have a, a number of condominium units and so forth that are built for right. short-term rentals. So right. I don't know that it's, I mean, we could go into some type of land use regulation, but I don't, I'm not seeing a strong need. Okay. You know, um, and, 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 and I have to say, you know, I don't know that we have a problem here, but I read about it in every other mountain community that's a problem, um, and maybe it's great. We don't have, it's not a problem here yet. Maybe we ought to be trying to figure out what it is we're trying to protect and put in place some protection so that a year from now, 18 months from now, two months from now, we don't find ourselves overwhelmed with these short-term rentals, and then we're gonna have lots of complaints, et cetera. So I don't think it's, we should take the edge, well, it doesn't seem to have been a problem, let's just forget it and move on because we're hearing about it lots of other places. And I think we have a very different kind of physical situation here and the, 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 the mix of our housing stock isn't as broad <coughs> as many other communities, um, but we should be looking at it, making sure that we are adequately protected from abuse. And I, I can't tell you anything more than that because I don't understand the problem or the issues well enough, but to me that's what we ought to be addressing as right. a complete team. Um, so Gary and, is it Doling? Yes. And Olga, if you, if you have a, like to make a public comment, that would be great. Here, come on up. Do <laughs> uh, you mind if I take off the mask? Please, please. <clears throat> hard to be understood. <clears throat> uh, my name is Gary Doling. This is my wife, Olga. We live at 303 Lamond Place, which is in the Melton Ranch subdivision and have lived there for 10 years or so and raised our family there. <clears throat> um, I, I've, and I've, I've written you all a letter to describe the situation at our property next door, which has come to our attention. Uh, is listed on ARB, has really been converted to a vacation rental, is being held out to the public as a place to uh, house groups of up to, they, they said 15 beds they have in a three bedroom home. Um, we've seen a lot of cars there. We've seen a lot of groups come in. They have a hot tub that's outside 
groups go to the hot tub, they drink, they have noise. We've, you know, we've had multiple noise complaints to the police. It, but it's, it's not so much about that. It's what came to my attention was the ARB, AARB advertisement. Um, I hadn't really been into this issue before that. And I said, well, wait a minute. This is not a, this is not a neighbor. This is a hotel. This is a business going on next to us that is accommodating our tourist guests, which is absolutely fine. You know, we are both a community and a resort. We need to house our, our guests to, to, to make the place what we like. Um, but do we house them in our single family residential neighborhoods, uh, allowing people to put 15 beds in a three bedroom home and, and bring in multiple groups? So I have a, you know, a parade of different people next to me in my single family Melton Ranch neighborhood that we bought three years ago. And this brings us to, 10 years ago, brings us to the um, kind of land use issue. And when we bought the house, it's in a zoned single family mm -hmm. neighborhood. The municipal code has a definition of what that is. It, the municipal code um, prohibits uh, double family, it prohibits condos, it prohibits everything other than single family residents. Um, there's the, we have a HOA uh, that has similar prohibitions, but the problem with the HOA is it's a very large HOA, it's very difficult to amend uh, the covenants to be more specific that it's difficult to enforce because you have so many different people. It's actually difficult to get a, a quorum at an HOA meeting because it's, it's large. It's, you know, and if you were a smaller group, it's much easier to control. Um, so which brings us to the function of what should the town be doing? What should the state be doing at the state level? What should the county be doing? You know, it's multifaceted. <clears throat> I've uh, gotten more interested in, in the topic uh, it's a topic of interest throughout Colorado. You know, Telluride, they have a ballot issue going on. It's, you know, it, different towns are dealing with it differently. I think the idea of coordinating with Aspen is a great idea. The um, <coughs> white paper that you produced, I reviewed that today. Um, great ideas, great concepts. You're hitting on the, the topics. I saw a, a, a legal seminar this week uh, town attorneys for Paradise Hills in Phoenix, you know, big neighborhood, talked about the problems they're having. Attorney for uh, San Diego, attorney for San Francisco. I mean, there's all kinds of different problems arising from the short-term rental issue, but I think it fundamentally comes down to <coughs> in a short, in a single-family residential unit, this is my problem, um, should I be required to have a hotel next to me? Uh, that's not what I signed up for. That's not what the law provides for. Um, and I applaud the efforts made to improve the regulatory structure in the future, which is, I think, needed. But what the current effort lacks is a, a look at what is currently on the books. We have a municipal code. We have a current zoning um, requirements to which our neighbor's property is subject. Um, I ask they be enforced. And we shouldn't have to wait for this process to be completed in order to uh, have our neighborhood protected. And uh, we're in a single family neighborhood. We shouldn't be living next to a hotel. Um, our neighbors, if they want to do rentals, to single family uh, occupancy, that, that's totally within the rights. To set up a business, bringing in groups of bicyclists, groups of skiers, unrelated groups, you know, 14 beds in a three bedroom home, that, you know, that's not what we signed up for and that's why I'm at my first town council meeting. And uh, I'd be glad to give you comments on different topics, but you know, my topic of concern is and this isn't the neighborhood that I want, and it's not the neighborhood that I bought into, and I would like my rights protected. Well, thank you, thank Gary. You. Really appreciate your bringing that forward. John, um, that's exactly what I was talking about. 
where it becomes a problem. So John, is Mr. Doling's interpretation of the code correct? He uses the uh, definitions at the beginning of the land use code and then those are applied through zone districts and their single family. And yes, he does. Um, the definitions do provide for some forms of short-term rentals. I mean, that's kind of been historic in, in uh, Snowmass's history. Um, he's also um, provided us with a copy of his request of the neighbor and copied the um, HOA. And he says that's a slow and cumbersome process. Um, and for the town to get involved, that would, that would be a zoning uh, violation that would be brought to the municipal court. I haven't seen the letter from December 26th. I saw the copy of the letter written by uh, Mr. Doling's law firm to the neighbor and copied to the master association. <clears throat> But I'm not going to say, I'm going to talk about the definitions. I'm not going to opine on the validity of his complaint, right. okay? Because it's, it's not right for me to say, I don't know all the facts. I know what he's written in one letter to the association. I've looked at the definitions that uh, were in the email today. Okay. Um, so, Brian, is there an enforcement issue? for this particular situation? Um, from a land use code, uh, uh, I'm not sure. John will have to weigh into that, and that would fall on Dave, and my department's totally willing to help. Um, so that, yeah, we'd have to explore that a little bit. I think that was news to, to everybody, that, that particular angle. Um, as far as municipal ordinances, from just so you know, from a noise standpoint, we have Unreasonable noise, disorderly conduct, prohibit, prohibit, uh, pro prohibit, uh, prohibition against nuances, uh, nuances, excuse me, um, nuisances. nuisances. Thank you. Limits on construction times, animal disturbances, uh, idling engines, mufflers. I mean, we, the municipal code has everything we need to handle the noise component of of any particular home. So if it's a land use thing, that's that's going to be between John and Dave and Clint, and we're happy to help. Okay. And, and fundamentally, it's if you're employing something like VRBO or something like that to advertise weekly rentals, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dolan's correct. That's a commercial use in a residential district, and that's that's really <laughs> the fundamental problem or question, however you want to look at it, that needs to be answered in a lot of communities. Is a commercial use okay in a residential neighborhood? Um, Great. Well, thank you for bringing you. that to our attention. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, we have another public comment. Sure. Go ahead, Bob. You had a question? Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, I just want to point out. Um, Mr. Doling talked about the um, snow. I presume you were talking about the Snowmass Homeowners Association when you talked about the homeowners association yes was that the was that the i think that our was property, that the one our property's within that's that master system. yeah okay so one of the comments one of one of the uh, items in the step 2 of the white paper relates to the um snowmass homeowners association um and i i think that it is important to understand the covenants of the Snowmass Homeowners Association and not just the covenants of what you can and can't do, but the enforcement part of that as well. Um, I, uh, and I guess if, um, if staff is looking for areas uh, you know, to look into and you get more information evolved, that, I would think that's that that, that should be yeah. one of them because, um, you know, there's no there's no point in duplicating between the town and the and the Snowmass HOA if there is enough in the Snowmass HOA to, you know, make 
um, to monitor this stuff. Well, I understand. No, the Snowmass Homeowner Association only applies to those That's residences true. that are in it. So, it, if if the town in step two wants to undertake um, coordinating with those regulations so that they're some sort of commonality across the town might be helpful. Agreed. I just wanted to clarify your use you. of yes, you're duplicate. Right. You're right, because the, the Snowmass HOA only, only you know, monitors a certain group of properties. Right, but it's a lot. Welcome. Hi, with permission, may I? Yes, please, off? just go ahead and state your name. Let us Hi. know what you're about. My name is uh, Cody Trescott from 281 Lamond Place. I am the big bad neighbor, I suppose. Um, I have a statement from my father who wishes he could be here. Uh, he decided not to travel due to COVID. So I'm gonna read that and it's gonna reference um, me being 72 years old. Obviously I'm not 72 years old. I'm gonna follow that up with a uh, highly edited statement from myself on the types of groups that we actually do host and uh, how we aim to contribute uh, to the community. Um, so this is from my father, uh, the, Al, Al Truscott. Uh, the preliminary white paper and council agenda items I've seen contain uh, problem definition questions that seem to misunderstand the original snow mass at Aspen land sales in the late 1960s and the nature of the community and resort over the last 55 years. I was in the room where it happened and I've been returning here ever since. In August of 1968, I was 19 years old. I'm 72 years old now. My mother and father, Harry and Ida Trescott, were not wealthy people. Harry grew up on a ranch in eastern Montana during the Depression, Ida on a farm in Iowa. Harry worked as an engineer at General Electric for over 30 years in Cincinnati building jet engines. They were drawn to the cosmopolitan resort surrounded by mountain wilderness that was Aspen in the 1960s. Harry always said, we decided to retire where our kids would want to visit, not the other way around. On their list were Boulder and Vail. Although they loved Aspen and had visited several times in the previous decade, it was beyond their middle class financial reach, even in 1968. Just before leaving Aspen in August, they learned of the new Snowmass at Aspen Resort and the accompanying land for sale. While the posh ski in, ski out land had already been spoken for, they were intrigued at the advertisements that explicitly promised vacation home sites on the north side of the valley, Melton Ranch, Wild Ridge, and Wild Oak, that were priced with the middle class in mind. And you can see these uh, sales uh, brochures at the uh, Aspen Historical Society. Um, Harry and Ida and myself and my sister drove up to the sales office in our Dodge and met with Kit Kane, an agent of the development company who launched into what was probably his routine three-point pitch. First, the land still available, while well, yes, not slope side, would still offer incredible access to all the year-round activities that would be popping up in the forthcoming decades. Second, this land would provide an incredible location for family vacations for generations to come. There would not be that many more opportunities in the future for such land so close to recreation and wilderness to be available to middle-class families. Third, he understood that the price of the land plus the cost to build would be a significant stretch for a middle-class family like ours. Mr. Kane pointed out that many of those building the vacation homes in Meadow and Sinclair and Oak Ridge would be renting them out regularly. That would go a long way in helping offset the significant costs. In fact, there were already families doing just that. And you can, again, see these advertisements of other families like ours uh, who throughout the 70s and 80s rented out their vacation homes in Meadow Ranch. The prospect of having, uh, this is key, and it seems to be missing from the fundamental questions about vacation rentals in the white paper that has been provided to the council. The prospect of having a desirable home and a vacation in a resort community that could be self-sustaining financially for a middle-class family was at the very heart of the sales pitch all the way back in 1968. After a quick, quick Jeep trip up the gravel road to the end of Oak Ridge, Harry wrote a check on the spot. My family, now in its fourth generation, has continued to call Snowmass our spiritual home for over five decades. But we would not be able to do that without the cushion that short-term rentals provide. Helping cover the expenses of taxes, utilities, and ongoing maintenance. Over the five plus decades that I've been coming to Snowmass, 
I have watched the community grow and evolve. When it comes to short-term rentals, I've actually witnessed a decrease in the number of homes available to rent because they're increasingly not being purchased by second homeowners. They're being purchased by third and fourth homeowners. And these people don't need to cover the expenses of taxes and maintenance and utilities in order to have their home in the mountains. They don't need to share the home. I urge you to maintain and improve the vacation rental system, which allows those of us who love this valley to continue to contribute to Snowmass and into the future. And now for a very pared down version of my comment. Who are our renters? Primarily, they are multi-generational families that have been staying in Snowmass vacation homes for decades. In fact, many of our renters had homes here themselves in the 70s and 80s before they were priced out. And some of them are still here and are actually our neighbors up the street who rent our home because their own family has grown too large to fit into their own. And they cherish that they're able to share the memories uh, with their grandchildren in a home environment where we provide ample board games, a kitchen, and you know the, the, the feeling of nostalgia that they left behind uh, decades ago. Second, our second market is groups of friends who have been skiing together for decades. Or increasingly, millennials who are just getting going with uh, group ski trips. And I'm particularly happy to have an increasing number of millennials lately uh, because for years and years the question was, you know, will, they, will younger people continue to come out and ski or will they be priced out? And what we're finding is that uh, an increasing number of millennials are indeed coming uh, and they are staying with us. Uh, third, we host community groups such as the Colorado Mesa University Ski Team, the French free Freestyle Ski Team, and the Solomon freestyle ski team. And contrary to some previous comments about X Games, the reason why some of these teams choose our home is because we're away from the hubbub and it allows the coach to have a more controlled environment for their athletes uh, and to sort of you know, keep them a bit un more under wraps. Um, we have indeed had one problem with an X game uh, renter who was in their mid 20s, uh, I believe in 2015 and uh, they tried to rent again in 2016, and we didn't want them there. We, we told them they couldn't come back. We're not here to host parties. Um, the other groups that we host, uh, let's see, uh, ESPN Film Crews, the Team Summit Colorado Youth Ski Team, who rents from us because we have a unique bed situation. We don't have 15 beds. The listing shows that we have 17 beds because what we do is I've created this reconfigurable bed option, which allows us to comply with NCAA and high school regulations uh, that no other homes are doing um, that allow for these groups uh, to have an affordable place to stay when they come out and train uh, with ACSB, I forget the exact acronym. Um, we've also hosted uh, the Israeli National Bike Team, um, who was uh, sponsored by a patron in Aspen. Uh, the Endurance Nation uh, Triathlon Team, which is uh, a group of my father's friends, essentially. Uh, and that they, there's 14 of them, and they come out, and they have a lovely time. And that's, that's my father and his friends. Um, we've hosted the National Brotherhood of Skiers. We've hosted presenters at the Physics Forum. And in the off-season, we oftentimes... Uh, try to reach out to construction firms uh, who use us as supplemental employee housing, um, which we're quite proud of, as you might imagine, giving my grandfather's background. Uh, fourth, over the last two years we've seen, and has been noted in a recent Lorenzo Semple column, a skyrocketing number of groups of people of color venturing both into summer and winter activities for the first time. The entire community uh, deserves some significant congratulations in this regard. People of color are coming to visit, and they feel welcome and safe, and uh, they're, they're staying in short-term rental houses, uh, again, where they can sort of coalesce and, and feel safe in that environment. Um, for us, that has meant a group of Thai immigrant bird watchers, several groups of Indian subcontinent immigrants uh, who work in tech, uh, who have a hiking and social group out of Denver. Uh, an African-American family who was just absolutely excited to be able to come to Aspen 
uh, for the first time ever, uh, they were decidedly lower middle in income folks who uh, uh, her, her father was not in good health and uh, they had a, a get together and uh, skied for the first time uh, over the free uh, skiing that they had <laughs> this uh, in the beginners area. We're very thrilled about that. Uh, we've also had a multi-generational Hispanic family celebrating a 30th anniversary and a vowel renewal. Uh, Asian American family enjoying Christmas together with the first generation of grandparents. Uh, we recently also had a millennial group of Hispanics, a millennial group of Japanese Americans. And this brings me to one of my more important comments. Second, in this newspaper, I believe it was the Aspen Daily News, maybe it was the Times, I don't remember, I read both daily, uh, was a comment from a Picking County Commissioner that floated the idea of limiting rentals to two people per bedroom. These facts are criticals, critical and shamefully connected, except I don't think anyone is quite putting it together explicitly yet in these two points. For the upcoming season, we have 48 guests, that's not like 48 different groups, that's 48 individuals who will be people of color, Hispanic, black, and Asian. Several of them will be first time skiers and I generally direct them to the local ski shops. Nearly half of our renters are people of color this season and that's incredible and awesome. If this so-called common sense compromise rule is passed that uh, Picking County, I believe, is proposing, and there's you know, some idea of coordinating, uh, we will have zero visitors that are people of color. 48 to zero. By artificially limiting their ability to stay with us based on the notion that they won't be comfortable if the cousins are bunked three in a, in a room, uh, that's just malarkey. It's also a classic example of insidious zoning that has no place in 2022. Our adult guests don't need a parental overseer to tell them how to arrange their sleeping accommodations. Our reviews speak for themselves and our larger groups are quite comfortable. As a point of contrast, 80% of our white visitors would fall under the acceptable number of people per bedroom and would not be impacted. Uh, yeah, my family's been out here since it was dirt roads and we're still out here because over the years, sometimes we've used our home as a long-term rental and we've rented to, um, you know, people needing uh, housing and we did that when my grandmother needed some money to help pay for her own assisted living. Before that, we actually had a uh, family friend who wanted to get started as a carpenter out here and we let him stay at our house uh, as long as he paid for the heat. I think he kept it at about 45 degrees. <laughs> uh, he became a carpenter and that allowed him to get his start in uh, this valley and he's moving next week uh, back home to Med, back home to Medford. I don't think he has ever lived there, but that's where his family now lives. Uh, and he was a carpenter in the valley for a number of years and built a number of houses. Um, over that time, I've been the, I was the, I attended more of the community uh, comprehensive plan meetings uh, than anyone who was not paid to be there. This is a place that we cared out <laughs> more deeply about than anything. And the idea that we may have to leave if we aren't able to continue to rent on a short-term basis is just troubling. I can also speak to sort of the you know financial aspects of the commercial nature of it. Had we just put our money in the S&P 500 index fund and done nothing, we would have twice, twice as much as we do now. It's not a good investment to have a short-term rental in Aspen Snowmass. I'm a participant in many Facebook groups online recently to get a sense of, well, because I've always just been doing this on my own without really reaching out to the broader world of what are they doing. And the broader world of short-term rentals, the profitable places to do it are in smaller towns. Yes, Snowmass is a smaller town, but in places where people, where you can get a home for like $180,000 and you can rent it for $200 a night because you've got people coming in from the cities to visit their family and they're used to paying, and $200 per night is, is nothing. And so the expectation is, is that you should make like a 10% return on your short-term rental. 
we don't make anywhere close to that. We broke even for the first time this last year and we, I didn't have to ask my aunt and uncle <coughs> to pony up additional money uh, to pay the taxes. We've been honestly late paying our property taxes several times because our cash flow just didn't cover uh, the rental and I know that for part of my family, they were no longer willing to sort of subsidize uh, having a home out here. And so gotcha. being able to, to rent to these, fam these other families who are, for the most part, you know, middle class, upper middle class. We even get some very blue collar people coming in to rent from us. Okay. I think we've got the picture. Thank okay. you very much for your comments. Um, do we have any other Bill, public comments? Bill, Bill, could I have, excuse could me. I have yeah. one? I have one question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I have one question for Cody. Mm -hmm. Cody, how much time do you or your parents spend in the house? Uh, about four months a year. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. We would spend more if we could. Bill? My name is Bill Boino. Um, <coughs> I manage the Pine subdivision. I came from Hilton Head, South Carolina in the 70s. And one of the reasons I left Hilton Head was because People were buying the properties and kicking the locals out, and the locals were having to drive an hour and a half to come to work, and they couldn't find a number of people to do the job then, back in those days. Sounds I came familiar. to Snowmass, <laughs> and I pushed the issue of let's build some housing for the middle market employees to buy. Before that, we didn't really have anything, so I've been on the forefront of seeing this. This last spring, I took a drive through um, the Northwest, Stopped in a lot of beach communities along the California, Oregon, uh, Idaho area. And a lot of these people, Friday Harbor, with, or can't find any employees because what's going on is the investment people have been coming in, buying the property, kicking the locals out who have been living there. And the businesses were struggling. A number of them have closed. I was reading some papers in that area in Sand Point, Idaho, Ketchum. A lot of people uh, have left. I talked to a couple of businesses in Ketchum, and they said they can't find anybody and they were really worried with what was going to happen this winter. When I started hearing what Aspen and, and Snowmass is looking at, um, it's important to address two different things. One, what are you going to do about the employee market that have been renting in the free market that are now being priced out because of the lease has gone too high? Because people are able to do short-term rentals. In my subdivision, my wife manages, back in the day in the divide, the divide went to the homeowners and was having problems with short-term rentals where people were driving through much faster than they should be, weren't respecting the property, and so the membership voted to restrict it as Horse Ranch has done. Um, I forget when the divide did that, but it's something that is being coming up with Horse Ranch now, uh, Fox Run, the Pines is talking about it, and you know now you see on TV there's a, the third home where you can just do a exchange from your rental to somebody else's and not pay any money at all. So there's a lot of different points that you guys have to deal with. Luckily, I'm not sitting in that seat anymore to have to think about this as badly or as strongly as you guys and gals are. But this is a problem for resort towns across the world, as was brought up. We just don't, can't find the people, and Snowmass has done a very good job building employee housing to try to offset some of that stuff. But as we're all seeing, that's uh, driven a lot of people out of town. Um, I just think it's very important that it's looked at in the two different ways. One, is this something that the free market subdivisions are having to deal with that are getting frustrated because some of the people who come there aren't respecting the area as much as owners are? And the second one is, what's going to happen with your employee market? Are we going to be able to find any housing somewhere else? You know, is Snowmass going to have to build a number more high rises like we have over the years for renters, short term, seasonal? Um, it, it's, it's tough living in a resort town, and as you, most of you know, you've, you've cut your teeth on some of this stuff, and uh, you know, the town's been able to, to build something to allow a few people to get into this. But I think it, it is a, a ch critical challenge that we all have to uh, understand the resort towns. If you look at the Ketchum paper, the Sandpoint paper, all these other areas, Friday Harbor, they're putting taxes out there to help defray some of these that the community can build, a, a similar uh, real estate transfer tax instead of going to the housing and instead of going to transportation and the rec center, 
and other things, they're putting some of this money into the community to help build more housing. You know, when you guys purchase some of the uh, Snowmass Inn and stuff, you know, you've got a lot of work to do there. The, gr the Green Ghetto has a lot of work to get done. And it may be something we have to float to the community. Can we do another uh, real estate transfer tax or something to help defray some of the expenses that we all know are going to be coming over the next you know, future of this community? It, it's troubling, and I think it's uh, important to discuss and try to get a handle on. So, Bill, in, in the Pines and in the Divide, are you seeing uh, a lot of short-term rentals or as the recent? The Divide, not because um, they put a restriction on it. As, as Tom said, you can rent as many over 30-day periods as you'd like, and one 14-day period <coughs> in a calendar year can you rent. We've had a few people we've had to chastise and chase after and tell them, we're going to come after you if you continue renting this way because it's been on the internet and you can see what they're doing and you know they're getting 20k a week for these things and uh, some people are needing to rent these things as Mr. Trescott uh, just mentioned to, to maintain them uh, you know Ida and Harry were great people and I really respected their their thinking what they had brought to this community <coughs> and I understand their dilemma and what they want to keep and so some of these things have to happen, but some communities limit the number of short-term rentals they allow in um, residential areas. But also I think the question of, is this a commercial endeavor in renting it? And if that's the case, there's got, there should be some other taxation fees or something put on because it is, it is challenging and it's not something that each subdivision needs to be dealing with. We've had, you know, one house started this they had uh, five different groups of guys in, and they were driving five different big suburbans around faster. I think they killed a deer, scaring people walking around, coming across that bike path from uh, sleigh ride to ditch. They didn't realize what was going on. They were just flying through there and, and scaring people. So that's part of the concern is when you have new newbies coming in that don't understand what Snowmass is, it's not Aspen. And it seems to be changing that way a lot recently. Um, but that's, you know, that's the nature of this beast. But I think we have to do some protection as best we can to, uh, is it a question of the employees? Try to maintain housing for those folks and not get them priced out because some investment group has come in and purchased it. And that, these are not, not something I see that you can really change that. Yeah. Okay, thank I'll, you. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Unless Thanks, Bill. Cool. Questions? Come on forward. Hello, everybody. Hi, my name is Mike George, and I guess this is a record two council meetings in one year. <laughs> um, first of all, I thank everybody for their comments. I think a lot of perspectives were raised, so I'm not going to repeat those. I just want to make a couple comments on things that uh, I heard tonight. I, I do think that the, first of all, I'm, a, I'm almost a 30 year Valley resident. I started renting down Valley. I've been fortunate enough to live in free market housing in Snowmass for the last 15 years. I'm coming to the tail end of my career. I'm 60 years old now. I've raised kids in the Valley, so I have kind of a broad perspective here. I work in property management, um, so I'm kind of a cross-section maybe of everybody. But I do think the visitors that, that do come here, even if they're not necessarily interwoven in the company, they are paying sales taxes, so they are contributing to the community. I think we all recognize and acknowledge that. That'd be one issue. I really like what John said. You know, HOAs have a lot of rules. It's almost impossible to enforce a lot of them. And if um, if the association, if one of the larger associations knew the town was, was writing code to support, let's say, how to uh, work around a zoning violation, I, I would love to get the properties that we managed to align their declarations and rules with the town code because it would be a lot easier to point an enforcement mechanism maybe other than going to a, you know, a civil suit. I think that, that would be helpful. Um, we're all struggling to find staff and contractors. I think we all know that's an issue. And I think we got what we decided we wanted because of, I'm old enough to have been here for the base village fight. And I think that passed by about two votes because a ski co bought beer for people that decided they were gonna vote if you just go over there and drink the beer. But we got what we asked for. And uh, we got all this volume and I think that the home issue that, that's been raised is difficult for all the reasons everyone brought up. I think that can be addressed through the mechanisms that are available to the community. Um, one thing I'd like to point out though is, uh, as Bob was asking for data, boy, you cannot turn left in this town 
anymore. And I think um, part uh, uh, how transportation works for the community is going to have to get looked at. Um, just today, there were cars past the fire station just waiting to get out at 3.30. And um, between 2.30 and 5, if you really want to turn left onto Brush Creek Road by Alpine Bank, that's really dangerous. That's a bad intersection anyways because of the slope of that road. And we're just directing on the commercial side, our drivers to use the roundabouts. We're, we're considering Snowmass a one-way loop now. It's a one-way loop. And um, I think that we have to consider stuff like that because I think we're all aware that there are a lot more people here. And it's by design. We designed the parking to be in the center of Base Village. We designed all that outflow to blow out of the village through one artery. And those of you who are old and gray-haired, there's a few of you. Ford Frick was the guy who told us we didn't have the road capacity to deal with this, and we listened to him. We nodded our heads, but we did it anyways. <laughs> and we have a lot more lodging coming on in the base that's just going to exacerbate this problem. And we all know, I think, anecdotally, that it's real estate prices that are the driving issue. It's pushing the workforce farther away. I'm going to tell you just anecdotally, I don't think that people are going to rent their multi-million dollar homes to our workforce. Our workforce right now is making between 20 and maybe $40 an hour at the very high end, and they simply couldn't afford to buy, and very few of them can afford to rent. And I think if we actually enforced all of our codes, we'd find out that a lot of our employee housing has far more people in it, um, more akin to the argument that there are 15 beds in a three-bedroom unit. I think that you know the, the, staff, the staff are doing what they can to find a, pl find a place to live. So I, I don't envy you your burden, but I think that Capping, real, or capping STRs isn't going to magically produce a large base of housing for our workforce. The property values are too high. You have to acknowledge that. There's some taxing mechanisms out there, and I think those might be valuable, but I don't think this is an STR problem in and of itself. These people are buying things all over town, and, and the entire community is benefiting from the sales tax side. I think the entire community needs to consider participating in the solution. I think if we just rush to cap STRs, we're going to have a bunch of unintended consequences that come out of that. I think that <clears throat> if we're generating sales taxes, everyone benefits from that. So it's, it's going to take a lot of work. I don't en envy you guys that. But uh, there were enough issues raised that I just thought I'd make those points. Transportation didn't, kind of got left out of it. I think to Bob's point, you know, if, if you can get the data, I don't know how many workers are actually available between Glenwood Springs or Rifle in here. I, I think maybe the, the age demographics and participants in the workforce might be valuable data to try and try and find. Because I can tell you that for at least the last eight years, and Bill's probably in the same boat as he stayed, you know, we can't buy housekeepers at 25 or 26 bucks an hour, and on a benefit load of bases, we're talking a $60,000 employee to clean units. We can't find them. Mm -hmm. We're hiring desk clerks at $20, $21 an hour, so is the town. You know, that's basically the lowest price price point of entry. And we're all short-staffed at that price point. So we clearly got out of balance. We tried really hard to plan this thing, but we have way too much real estate and way too little infrastructure. And I just ended that. And uh, you know, if you need some help from the community and I can find the time, happy to, get, happy to help. Thanks Thank for your you comments. Guys. Thank you, Michael. Hi, I'm Lance Clark. I'm the president of the Meadow Ranch Homeowners Association Board of Directors. And we are very, very concerned about this issue and are very glad that Snowmass Village is looking as if it's going to take it seriously like Pitkin County has and Aspen has and Crested Butte has and Summit County has and everybody in resort communities throughout the world. Uh, we're a community of 60 units. We're single family homes, duplexes, and fourplexes. We're primarily a community of full time snow mass residences, residents. Uh, we have very few units that are even rented long term, five or six of the 60. I think uh, when I was listening, Tom said it very clearly. There's resort housing, and there's community housing. And they can be and should be treated differently. And it, our feeling, the board of directors of Meadow Ranch, is that we're a community and short-term rental of our units is not appropriate under any circumstances. So 
We're very hopeful that SNOMAS will take this seriously and try to do something to assist us. We're looking at our own covenants, uh, hopeful that we might be able to do something ourselves, but that's really, really difficult to change covenants. Uh, in our case, it requires uh, approval of 85% of the owners and all the mortgage holders, uh, something that's really difficult to do. Uh, we would like assistance from Snowmass Village, and we're willing, the five board of directors, to do what we can to work with you and give us, give you any kind of information that we have and what our feelings are. But everybody uses their, their anecdotal situations, but there was a recent sale uh, in Meadow Ranch that clearly was a price that did not justify the building or the ability of someone to live there even as a part-time owner. There's no question that the goal is to <coughs> short-term rent it. Mm -hmm. And the infrastructure just can't deal with it. We don't have the parking. Uh, having different people moving in and out on a weekend and a weekly basis is not the kind of community that we feel we are or where we would really like to live. So we're hopeful that we can get some assistance from the town and it's complicated, no question about it, but we're willing to help. Well, Lance, before you leave, um, thank you for your comments. Um, I understand what you're saying about 85%, but it might be easier for you to get your 85%. Than for the town well, we're, to be able to act. I mean, I I really think that that is the level at which these things need to happen is in the local HOAs, you, because that's where you have the vested interest. You want to pr preserve your community. Yeah, and and we're moving forward. We're hiring an attorney and going to look at our covenants and try yeah. to figure out how to do it. But I mean, Fox Run. I I just happened to have it. It was uh, it was done in two thousand one which maybe was easier to do back then, but just living it to nothing less than 30 days except once a year for 14 days. Pretty straightforward. But you got to do it now before more people well, we, sell to the corporations. That we realize that the yeah. iron is has to be struck now, yeah. Yeah. both with HOAs and with the town. Yeah, that's what we're talking. Thank you. Good. Any other public comments? <clears throat> okay, John? I just wanted to point out that what Tom brings up and, and other people are talking about, Lance is talking about, there is, a, there is a counter to that as well. There are complexes and associations that don't allow you to be in residence. So I just, there's a whole other side of the picture than kind of what you've generally heard here tonight. They so don't there, allow you to be in residence? Is that what you yeah, 45-day limit. Per season, and the rest of the time you have to rent. Hmm. So, yeah, that's right, that's right. the opposite end of the spectrum yeah. that you're talking about. And I just it hasn't been mentioned tonight, so I thought you need you, you do need to know that it's out there. I assume those aren't so much single-family homes as more condo complexes. No, nope. right? right, but it's it's, it's very much recent amendments to their covenants that require it. Uh -huh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. I think we're going to hold off on the public comments from now. Let's. Um, yeah, just a question, though. Sure. Go ahead. When would be an appropriate time to uh, send some proposals on uh, things that could be done to uh, help the situation? Uh, you're always welcome to send us public comment. Okay. Um, any further questions of staff? Okay, Clint, what have you heard? <laughs> <laughs> um, just reading through quick notes backwards, um, trying to understand a little bit, and please correct me, this is kind of where I think I'll take it from here if it works for you guys. Um, and this is in no good order, so I'm not going to sound articulate in the least. but. I think we definitely need to go to the full license, like the white paper uh, talks about, so we get more data about when and where. I think that's a, that's a slam dunk. Um, I think the workforce housing issue 
and funding more workforce housing needs to be further discussed by the council. There's an option in the white paper talk, talking about you know maybe changing some of our um, currently earmarked taxes to broaden up the use of those for more workforce housing. I think differentiating between single family neighborhoods and um, well, I, to use council services, good words, the, I have to go back up to these notes, but the community versus uh, commercial aspects, I think we need to find a way to do that and likely that single family neighborhoods. Um, I mean, I, we need to better understand the current language in the municipal code, and um, if it currently does, if it is that specific that it limits one single thing, if it does currently do that, which I'm not 100% clear that it does, but if it does, the code might be in place right now, if, and to say that, you know, that's not there. Um, I think the, the idea of controlling corporation or, uh, you know, ownership for a, for a license might be a way to make sure that it is family owned and not um, um, hedge fund owned. And I don't know if that's the right way to differentiate, but you know, something along those lines. Um, and certainly understanding that no one in a single family, or no one wants to live next to a hotel, especially if they didn't sign up for it, but we need to find a way to control that. Um, uh, and then treating resort housing from community housing differently, finding out how to differentiate. I mean, and you all know this better than I do, but that line between resort housing and community housing can blur pretty quickly about where it is, you know, is wood, which, which, what is Woodbridge, what is Snowmass Mountain Condos, what is uh, Seasons 4, you know, those kind of differentiations will come back to you guys to make that decision on. But um, I think if, it, if you're comfortable, we can come back with some specific examples if we're kind of close to the discussion. And you guys can weigh in on some ideas that we can come back to you with that are far more specific, but largely from the white paper already. Okay. Sounds good. Clint, um, if Clint has missed. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Well, I, I, I agree, Clint. And, uh, you know, <coughs> under the circumstances, for instance, with, uh, with Cody's property, his family property, they've been coming for years. They've been doing this for years. Um, I, I totally understand that and, and what, what it takes to save the property. But in the same token, we have family, we have single family residences dealing with that. And I don't, I just, I think something needs to be done on both ends. I, I, I don't know what it is. I don't have a solution like uh, there's, is there a silver bullet here somewhere uh, that everybody, <coughs> in every community, every municipality is trying to find. Um, I, I, the, the control of the real estate market, we can't control because it's private property. I know that in my field in built in, in the building industry when i when i go for a permit that general permit if i'm going for a sub permit is listed under an llc all these properties are being bought by llc's or corporations or something or as tom fritstein says hedge funds you know I, that's, what's the difference it's still a, a corporate <coughs> property tax situation and we can't control that and I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what direction we can. How? What can we do? I don't. I don't know. I don't. Have, again, I, I. don't have a silver bullet. Tom, if I could just jump in on, on that one point. I think, it's it's not the type of corporate entity because a lot of LLCs are just families and doing it to protect themselves. But, it's what's the purpose of the, of the purchase? Is it? To we be, don't know. To, but we I, don't know. I understand. But that's what we need to get to. If somebody's just single family home and they buy it on an LLC, that's fine, but they buy it as an investment to make it a short term you know, rental so operate as a hotel. How, how strong else. is the HOAs? That's the, that's, isn't that the question? I mean, and, and, and when <clears throat> I've spoken with different attorneys and what, what can you do about this? Well, the HOA rules over any other situation. So I, you know, I, we can't trump the HOAs. As far as I'm concerned, John, you maybe I, you can answer that question better I, than I would I, add. That, I would add that to Clint's list. Let's learn more about. Well, let me, the let me finish, Tom. I'm first, sorry. okay, yeah. please. I mean, you you've given me an avenue uh, to to make Go a, ahead. a Go statement. Ahead. So, and 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 that's what I I want to say. And and to Clint is, what how how do we take power? How can we get control of some of these HOAs? Not control, but how can we influence some of these HOAs? To put their foot down. Well, and I think I'd ask the question differently. I mean, is it? A <laughs> if, it's, if it's 
a matter of local control. The HOA is the most local. Some of them might want it, some of them might not. Meadow Ranch clearly doesn't. See, Th that's sport. because it's way too big, and you know. But I mean, I, I think, but I think what we as as ta town government need to come up with are regulations that go townwide, and then provide strength to the HOA. Mm -hmm. Be my my off the cuff answer to you that our regulations need to. It, you know, the authorization and the the control of it, uh, as in our police force, they're, they're put into a situation that the HOA could trump in a lot of situations, correct? I don't, I, I mean, because if, if there's a noise violation, that's one thing, that could happen anywhere. Sure. But if the, it's a matter, of how, a matter of how many people are living in this three bedroom home that's got 15 beds in it, I don't, I, don't, I, I, I can't understand how the fire the fire department can't put their foot down as well as in, in helping some of these situations. And again, my, my law school degree doesn't exist, but I mean, there's habit, habit, habitability codes. There are ways to do it. Um, but again, those are ideas we can bring back to you and you're gonna have to decide as a council, how deep do we wanna dive into it? Okay, anyway, I'm, I'm done. I'll get off my platform. All right, Alyssa. Everyone has a lot to say, <laughs> man. Um, well, I think Clint, unless I missed it, I think one of the things that was missing maybe was just the HOAs and understanding what the different HOAs are doing. I mean, I, I have horse ranches pulled up here and it's very specific. Um, I think that a lot of the, a lot of it depends on where you live. I mean, I know in, in our neighborhood where you have a lot of full-time residents and families with kids, I mean, it's way different than if you live at one of those condos that's on Fanny Hill where you're not, you don't have as much of that. Um, you know, I think Mountain Ranch, Meadow Ranch, some of these where you have these long-term people, you feel differently. I yeah. mean, I know that when we lived in Aspen, before we made the smart choice to come to Snowmass, <laughs> we had we owned our half of our duplex and the people next to us rented and it was awful. I mean, they terrorized us and we had little kids and that was not fun. And I appreciate people that wanna be able to live in their home and, and not have to worry about that stuff. And um, I will also say though, I do appreciate people that want to be able to get their little slice of heaven and come here and the only way they can do it is if they rent their property some of the time um, because that is a reality for a lot of people not a lot of not some of the people that come here but there are enough people that that does make the difference for so you know that i've listened to everything i've made a lot of notes um you know clint i think you did a really good job um, recapturing it i would say the one thing is um you know, this changing of the tax structure to allow for dedicated marketing tax and lodging tax to be used for workforce housing. Like, I want to understand that versus like what Avon did with this 2% tax that they just had go through on their ballot last fall. So just maybe looking at the different options and weighing the pros and cons. And I know we have Rose sitting here and, you know, she's, you know, the, mar <laughs> the marketing tourism person. And what that means for her budget and things like that. I wanna understand that all a little bit more in depthly, but we do have a lot of amazing housing projects. And one of the things that we've seen when we did the master plan was the expense of it all. And so if we can somehow help that, and I think that a lot of these people that do the rentals, they want to be able to contribute to the community. So, you know, that is an extra way to do that. So that's, I think that's it. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> Clint, um, I do want to, uh, I, I did have in mind to talk about what uh, Alyssa just spoke about, but I do, uh, but I want to add something to it beyond using marketing and, and lodging um, tax um, that we look into and consider um, a fee or whatever. Uh, or, or an additional tax um, that's separate from separate from from marketing, or that's separate from marketing, which is a which is a, uh, a short-term rental tax, um, similar, I guess, to a lodging tax, uh, or in addition to it, maybe it's a fee specifically earmarked for um, workforce housing. 
Um, I, I think. It's like on single family homes or? Oh, even on single family homes. No, or short term In other rentals. words, anyone who's short term rentals, anyone doing a short term rental. That's not, that's not a hotel. Yeah, except not the hotel, right. <clears throat> Don't we have that now? Well, our logic tax is on, if you, if you, any tax, if you rent for less than 30 days, we collect that tax. Yeah. Right. But I'm talking about specifically an addition earmarked for, um, for uh, workforce housing. Oh. oh. That would go towards workforce. That would go I towards see. workforce housing specifically, not be commingled with something else. I see. And just for those people who haven't uh, taken a look at the white paper, just kind of a cursory view there of Snowmass Village, 966 single family units, 2,820 multifamily units, 982 lodging units, which is a total of 4,768. Of those STRs, there's 1,699 units, 880 are hotel rooms, 735 are condos, and 84 are private homes. So I think those are the numbers that um, we'll be looking to the staff to try to come back to us with some, um, you know, a logical path forward. I think Clint, you, you know, you've outlined it well, and um, let's let's take that next step. I'd just like to add one last comment. Um, my biggest concern is 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 the you know I'm, I'm not opposed to short-term rentals, and I can understand how they can help people, but when it's abused, that's, I think, what we need to be looking at. Um, and I'm not as worried about making sure we get all the revenues from it. I don't want what we heard is a neighbor feeling that they're living next door to a hotel. To me, that's the biggest issue, and I don't know how we get to that. But it's really a land use thing. Zoning was invented so that people could buy a property and know what they could expect their neighbors to be. And the short-term rental seems to be, has found a loophole to abuse the land use to take a short-term, a, a single-family home in a residential neighborhood and make it into a commercial property. And to me, that's, when it's abused to that extent, that's what we need to be addressing. To me, that's the single most important concern. Thanks. All right, I appreciate everybody's comments. It's an uh, emotionally charged issue, but an yeah. uh, important easy. one for all of us. We'll have something easy. tomorrow morning. I'll be like Bill Compton's. It'll be in, it'll be in your inbox in an hour. <laughs> Great. He has a lot That's, of raw data. To yeah, it's like he's got okay. more than I got. Last you. item on the agenda, agenda is uh, council reports and actions. Tom? So, CORE, we have, uh, we have made a change, as Bob knows. And Bob has been... Uh, move to the primary position, mainly just so everybody understands. It's not like I, I'm not going anywhere. It's, it's because they, in order to get Bob's financial help on the board, he has moved to basically the, the accountant for CORE. Treasurer, and, please. <laughs> Treasurer. More or less the accountant. You have to hold Bob's, the money, Bob's not Super count Bowl. the money. <laughs> Bob Super Bowl. So at any rate, I'm still involved, but I also also want to mention again the, the the local post office. I thought is doing an excellent job. Will and 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 Stacy you know down it. They, what's that? You know why? Well, I, you could you could comment on that, but I just <laughs> I don't know why. But I I think they're just doing a, a better <clears throat> job than anybody has done in the past, and uh, and I, I just want the, the community to know and understand. That they, they're trying so hard. They have they're, they're getting extra help from different places, and um, it, I, I've had nothing but but very good success with them this this past holiday season. I agree, much better. Yeah, much better. I don't think I have anything. But I want to know why. Well, because <laughs> I will just say that they now have some women in there, and those women <laughs> have really cleaned everything up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if okay. that's the answer, but one way or another, we've got some hard workers there. Yeah. Finally, no. I think yeah. it's a You've been talking to my daughter lately, haven't you? No, I just think <laughs> women have a different vibe, and, and, and I just noticed when they started being there more often, it changed. So I'm going to attribute it to that. 
Okay. Um, Board of Health meeting is coming up on the 13th, uh, so I don't have anything to report on that front. Um, Nordic Council trails are in great shape, so get out and enjoy the trails. Except for all the people walking on them. <coughs> <laughs> yes, the... I've seen the signs. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> apparently not everybody reads the signs. No, but they put in different signs. Now they have these like signs that's right when you walk onto the trail that's basically like, do not walk here. Yeah. The symbols, people don't look at no. symbols. They need the words. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have anything, Bill. Okay. Tom? Nope. Well, except I will agree with Tom that I think the post office is doing much better. I know the town has absolutely nothing to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion to adjourn. I so, move to adjourn. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Next week's roundabout, so we'll just stay with the fun ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>